Alhamdulillah, today we are gathered here to go over um, Surah Al Hujra. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in those two and a half pages, has covered uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things um, for us to be able to establish in order. And one of the things is with this book, we know that a lot of the events that have happened over time with the companions, what they did, and then they responded to it. Many of the things in Surah Al Hujra, um, excuse me, excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> Many of the things in uh, the events that happen, so we have this Babylon Azul, and so today we'll go over some of the things, but um, one of the things as far as the companions, they say, submit not while it's happening. We hear and we obey. And we can easily fall into the category of submit not while it's happening. Submit not while it's happening. And we hear and disobey. Submit not while it's happening is not just verbally saying it. We talk about the the, the people that had the guidance and um, Bani Israel, uh, as far as saying it, they said it in the action. They say it out their mouth one thing, but in the actions, they do submit and while saying it. And unfortunately, we have fallen into that category because we don't know. So, alhamdulillah, we've gathered um, today and we have a uh, uh, steam panel um, of brothers that uh, you know, scholars, alhamdulillah, um, and so what we're going to do right now is introduce the brothers that we have here. So uh, we we'll start working from our right side. So, um, well, go ahead. We we'll start actually. So, okay. Introduce yourself and give yourself give a bio, please. Alhamdulillah, Hamdan Kathir in Danan, Washadu in La Ilahi in Bullah, Wahdabu La Sharikila, Washadu Anna Muhammadan Abdu Rasul, Wasallallahu Wasallam wa Barak Ali, you are Ala Ali, you are Sabbat, Women Tabia Humbe, Sam Ilayub, Wasallam at the Sleep. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Ali Jab bin Hisham. I'm Imam of Masjid Dar Islam in Elizabeth, New Jersey. I am, I guess I'll tell you my age, I'm 70 years old. So uh, I'm not the oldest in here, I know that, I'm looking at <laughs> According to the program, I'll be very brief. Um, I belong to one of the oldest families in America. And uh, I began my Islamic education in La Makut Shabab when I was a, a, a small kid. And they called Beit al Hikmah. It was with the Dino Allah University Arabic Association. And that's another story. However, in the, that was in the uh, 50s and 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. I had an opportunity under uh, the auspices of the uh, Sheikh bin Baj, Allah yarhamu, rahmatun uh, he, uh, he was uh, director of what is known as Dar al Ifta, which was in, uh, under the auspices of Imam Muhammad uh, ibn Saud uh, University, uh, which gave me an opportunity for higher education in Islam. Alhamdulillah. And since, since then, I've been, um, uh, I've been in a large part of the world. I've been traveling in a large part of the world. Also, uh, I've been the Imam, the daughter of Islam, for nearly 30 years. So, uh, you know, that's probably, you know, older than most of you, you know, many of you. Uh, also, um, uh, we had some, some exciting things that happened in our life. My father was the one who buried Malcolm. I'm the one who buried Malika. I was also the pallbearers for, Ma for, for Betty Shabazz. And we also sort of, uh, you know, kind of keep what's left of the family intact, mashallah. I was able to take Elias Shabazz, who wrote a book, Growing Up X, to Hajj, mashallah. Her mother was Hajj and her father was Hajj. And alhamdulillah, we uh, was able to take her to Hajj and try to keep uh, Islam present in the family. And lastly, we were also, I was one of the key coordinators for 
Why Jumal Capitol Hill? I don't remember if any of you was there. This was 2009, September 2009. They called us everything except Abdullah, but we was able to pull it off, alhamdulillah. And uh, lastly, uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, a father, grandfather. Uh, I have two wives and a pistol. Um, uh, <laughs> that's the truth. Um, uh, Alhamdulillah, I'm, 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 I've always been black and Muslim. And, uh, and I tell you a little something before I close. The reason why I say that, because when I was in, in grade school and in middle school, I used to go to school and take my kufi off just to hang out with everybody else. But then one day, my principal said to me, you know, I'm going to tell your father, my, my principal was a Yahoo, he was a Jew. He said, I'm going to tell your father, every time you come into the building, you take your kufi off. I said, you'll tell my father? He said, I'm going to tell your father that. Because I didn't know he was a friend of my father's. Later on, we became very good friends, and he made sure that I was able to function in school at that time because of uh, the things that were going on in the world that day. So I'm going to end here. And as we go along, I can insert a lot of things I wasn't able to say, but for the sake of time. Oh, and I like since uh, uh, Sheikh Mohammed the Bashir, uh, Sheikh, we grew up across the street from one another. All right, I think he's in, he's in his 70s. No, I ain't going to say that because, you know, but he's a year or two older than me. And, uh, and, and uh, he and my son-in-law, Hassan Abdullah, was the lead attorney for the first World Trade Center bombing. They were the attorneys who defended the, 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 those who allegedly uh, uh, bombed the World Trade Center. So we've been quite active. So as we go along, you'll find out uh, how active we've been. So alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our time. And may we say, Aqulu qawli hadha asakiru Allah li wa lakum wa li sa'ila muslimi. Bistakfuru, inna hu kum kafuru. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. I'm your brother in Islam, Muhammad, the son of Munir, Abdul Hamid, 39 years old, born and raised Muslim from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. A couple of years ago, I migrated to New York City, things to be exact. There, you can find me, inshallah ta'ala, with a book and a cup of tea. I enjoy traveling, meeting people, um, not to praise myself, but just trying to be honest. I, I, I find it a pleasure to teach classes. Uh, it's the greatest satisfaction for me to pass on something of the little that I know to another Muslim or non-Muslim. So I enjoy meeting my brothers and sisters for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn, to be reminded, or perhaps give a benefit here and there. I'm very happy to be here today, alhamdulillah. And I hope that this conference will be a benefit for all of us, make us better Muslims, make us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I appreciate uh, Brother Tariq inviting me. I appreciate the other brothers and sisters who uh, helped organize and orchestrate. And I appreciate uh, everyone attending, uh, the esteemed panelists, all of the attendees. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you good in this life and the hereafter. Jazakumullah khair. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ala Abina Muhammad, Wa Ala Alihi Wa Ashabihi Ajma'een. In my back, Assalamu Alaikum Wa Rahmatullah. I am your brother, Aqil Ingram, um, originally from New Jersey, but somehow found myself out here in Maryland, DMV, DC, Baltimore area. Um, since we're doing, since we're doing ages, what we gotta do? We did 70, what, so you're 39 now? Not one and a half. SubhanAllah. All right, so uh, I'm at 43. Uh, recently, I reached 43. Alhamdulillah. So um, at present, that places me between our two brothers. Um, I, I think that makes me the second youngest. We're we going to find out. <laughs> but um, I, I enjoy service in the Muslims. Um, those of you that know me, I've been around for a little bit. Um, just, just trying to help out. So I'm here trying to help out today and benefit from all of you. and. And if it's from all our brothers, you for the Steve Panel to settle with us today. God of love. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyid ibn al-Khaleem. Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Assalamu alaykum. Wa tullahu wa barakatuh. My name is Zayd Shakir. 67 years old. And... Uh, Alhamdulillah, it's been a, an interesting, long, and uh, 
interesting journey. Ms. Mount converted in 1977 and had a great opportunity to participate in establishing Masjid al Islam. And not even before that, we were in college in New Jersey, uh, Masjid al Huda, which has become New, Jersey, I mean New Brunswick Islamic Center in New Jersey, and then Masjid al Islam in New Haven, Connecticut, and then the Lighthouse Mosque in Oakland, California, Daytona College in Berkeley, California, something that we call the uh, Connecticut Muslim Coordinating Committee in 1991, it was, and then another organization called the uh, Tri-State uh, Muslim Educational Initiative, also around 1991-92. So, alhamdulillah, and again, I, I enjoy being with the Muslims. May Allah bless this gathering, and may Allah reward Brother Qadi for his uh, Noble intention bringing us together here. Salam. Amen. Alhamdulillah. Um, you know, these brothers are humble, mashallah. You know, um, um, you know, Imam Zaid is also a poet. You know, Alhamdulillah. Allah maybe we can share some of his poetry with us um, uh, today. Uh, I don't think even Mufti mentioned that, you know, he has a uh, master's in, in hadith from, you know, Medina University. Alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue uh, to allow to, to benefit uh, the community and all of uh, the imba here uh, on stage. Um, I'm the middle child, mashallah, in this group here. Uh, Alhamdulillah. Uh, Imam Zaid is probably, you know, uh, him being accepting Islam is probably older than me, right? So I was also born in uh, 1977, you know, so I'm 46. Uh, well, Alhamdulillah, uh, born. Uh, born Muslim, third generation, uh, my father, Imam Muhammad, uh, the brother of Imam Ali, and my grandfather, Sheikh Hisham Jabba, rahimahullah. Um, and my specialty has been, you know, uh, just utilizing uh, my degree, uh, which is a master's in uh, global management, to service the Muslims. So um, over 20 years, I've been pretty much uh, program organizer, event coordinator, um, doing you know events for the community, um, for the massages, um, and also the youth. Um, so um, youth empowerment, um, just uh, dealing with the youth, uh, counseling youth, doing youth programs. Uh, alhamdulillah. Um, also had the opportunity to travel abroad uh, to study Arabic in Morocco as well as Egypt. Um, and you know this is what I try to stick with uh, is you know the Arabic language. Uh, but I I have about 20 years experience in Islamic education, working um, in Islam as a teacher, uh, as an administrator, and also as a principal. Um, currently, I hold a position as the Quran Arabic and Islamic Studies uh, uh, Director for a school in Tampa, Florida, University of Academy of Florida, uh, where I do uh, mainly educational consulting uh, with them, uh, and uh, my current profession is teaching Arabic um, in Newark School of Global Studies. Uh, which is a public language school uh, in Newark, New Jersey. Alhamdulillah. As you see, we have um, a pretty strong panel, brothers that have studied. And these are also um, people that have pretty active, uh, pretty much chosen people. These are people I've known uh, throughout the uh, couple, for a good period of time, seeing they've been active in the community. And the issue of brotherhood is very important. One of the things uh, going through the Surat al you see that um, you know we're in violation of many things. We have a, a, a program, a program of you know uh, my code is Islam, and um, we even have shirk. My code is Islam, and so people like you know your code is Islam. Well, one of the things is is when you're in a fraternity, you have a code, you abide by. You're an electrician, you have a code, you abide by. You're, you know, in any type of, any order, you have a code. And these are the codes that are created by the group, man. And if you violate the code, people have a problem with you. It's clear. It's no problem. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a code of conduct, a code of life, a code of belief that we're supposed to have. And when we sent down this revelation during that 23 year period. And one of the things is, is, you know, as we know, our example is Muhammad ibn Abdullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and also the people that were around him. We like to turn, you know, say the companions and these different things, but these are individuals that were experiencing this revelation over that 23 year period. These were individuals that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would send revelation about them. I would always talk to the people and ask them a question. Imagine being in that situation where you um, said something to your wife, you're like the back of my mother, right? You know, you said that to her, and then you went to Mass J. Then somebody came up to you, one of the companions came up and said, uh, you know, that uh, the Rasul Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has received a new revelation. And it's like, oh man, so you're excited. And then he starts to be, he's excited, you and I, and you're there, and you hear him recite. And he's reciting that, I heard the call of a woman that complained about her husband, you know, and that's you. And after, how would you feel? You know, how would you feel when you go back to, and how did that happen? Because it happened. And so these are people you're hearing, and it's like for the rest of, from now, from that time to eternity, this is about an action that you did. So I'm sure the people, when he went back to his wife, it changed the relationship, as you know, when you study. And then the other brothers, and then the sister. Imagine that, that you pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concerning the injustice that's going on to, about your husband. And then Allah sends revelation that Allah hears your call. And he tells the world, he tells them from now, from then, all the way to existence that he heard. So how would you feel? You see, and one of the things we really don't talk about, that and the reality of real human beings that was experiencing this phenomenon, this spiritual phenomenon, that events were happening, and it was about them. And so one of the things is, is these people, when they would hear these things, they respond. And if when they if they didn't respond, then you know there's something they're not from. They're not with us. Because we told you that call out of Sallallahu call Allah Adam. He said it, Allah, the messenger said Allah said this, and then you're doing something different. He said it was supposed to come together, but you're going, nah, nah, but see today we put the Quran on the shelf, but it's not part of our life because we're not related. We don't understand that it's wrong. We don't understand that we really don't have a choice. We have a choice to not do it, but then the thing is, is in the next life, we're going to be of those that said significant So, um, one of the things is, is uh, we wanted to start off in talking with the different brothers and give an opportunity as far as the issues and concerns of brotherhood. What are the things, that, you know, some of the things that we need to deal with, and then we'll go over what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, how, um, uh, when, they, when the revelation came down, how did they, you know, experience it? What are the things that, that, that how did the companions react? How are we reacting to this? And what are the things that we can do? So we're going to start off with, um, you know, we have 15 minutes. we we'll start off with, with uh, the first item, or the first section. Everybody has a copy of this. We kind of broke it into sections, even though we have 18 items. Some of them, yeah, you know, have two, and some of them combined. So the first one that we're starting off, and on this one, everybody has to. And then when we come back, we saw a lot of different um, uh, of the speakers will choose different ones that they would prefer to expound on, or they can expound on more, you know, choice wise. So, the first one, I will give you a little bit of 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 a أعوذ بالله من شيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله واتقوا الله من الله السميع العليم All you believe do not put yourselves before Allah and his messenger but fear Allah indeed Allah is hearing and knowing A brief explanation is the prohibition of making decisions in advance of Allah and his messenger ordering respect who was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I want to add to that when I pass it on. In this case, you know Medina was a city-state. And if you look at this surah very carefully, they're establishing a protocol, a chain of command, of respect and honor. If they did not have that, then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not have conveyed the message to the, to the especially the, the, the Arab, the, the one who was who was not groomed, who was not polished. And they would call on the Prophet and send him the Hujarat, referring to the, 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 the rooms of, of the chambers of his wives. And some would say, Ya Muhammad. We don't refer to Muhammad, you know, Ya Rasulullah, as we, as we know that they learned to, to address the Prophet So in, in short, we're looking at where there's a protocol set up that will determine 
how we address our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and our approach to those orders that came through that medium. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so we can, I'll, I'll leave something open for the brothers to continue on. Uh, Tafadda. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakallah khairan shaykh. Very briefly, obviously we don't have that much time. Uh, instead of commenting on the first ayah, I would give a very simple, concise summary of Surah al Hujurat with regards to one of the most important fields of Islamic study. That every single Muslim should have something of. Not the scholar, not the student of knowledge, but the nine to five layman Muslims should have some basic cognizance, some basic understanding of this field of Islam. And it is that which is called Ulum al Quran. Ulum al Quran, which is translated to be the academic study of the Quran. Every single Muslim should have something of this basic science. So, Surah Al Hujrat is obviously the 49th chapter in the Uthmani Mus'haf. The Quran wasn't sent down in the exact order that we have today, but in the uh, organization or the arrangement of Uthman, the Sahaba finalized for this chapter to be number 49. Secondly, this surah was sent down after Al Mujadila, the woman who came to the Prophet وسلم, uh, complaining about her husband who said something to her which was wrong and incorrect and derogatory. You to me are like my mother's back. You're not my wife, basically. I can't do anything to you like I can't do anything to my mother. And it was sent down before Surah to Tahrim. The Surah that Allah talks about something simple and basic, but something that had a very uh, far reach. And that was when the Prophet was sitting with his wives, he told one of them a secret, they disclosed that secret. Did you drink honey? All right? Uh, and the, the, the ins and the outs of that story. And there are many other things mentioned in at tahrim as well, such as the hypocrites, uh, protecting your children, etc. Uh, thirdly, Surah al um, it's very concise, relatively small, quote unquote, in its size. Okay, uh, we have uh, uh, 19 uh, ayat, 18 ayat, it's very small, but it's very deep and profound. Afterwards, uh, it should be point number four, if I'm not mistaken. Surah al Hujrat is Madaniya. All of the scholars agree that Hujrat was sent down after the Prophet's Hijrah, not before the Hijrah when he was in Mecca. Where was it sent down? Ta'if, Mecca, Medina. Medini means after Hijrah and not necessarily in Medina. All right, point number five. Uh, Surah Al-Hujrat, according to many scholars, is the beginning of that which is called Al-Mufassal. The Quran is sectioned off into the first seven long surahs, okay? And then we have towards the end, Al-Mufassal, 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 and Tiwal Al-Mufassal. The surahs that, number one, have a lot of breaks in between the ayat. In contrast to Ma'idah, Al-A'raf, okay, Baqarah, Ali Imran, in which the verses are relatively long. But these surahs towards the end of the Mus'haf, there's a lot of pauses and breaks, Secondly, these surahs are recommended to be recited in the five daily prayers. Bukhul Asr, Maghrib Isha, they go hand in hand. And last but not least, what I'll mention without a lot of time, uh, Surah to Hujarat has many objectives and aims. And from those aims is the establishment, the preservation, protection of brotherhood. But the first verse clearly gives a greater principle and a higher aim the establishment of obeying Allah and His Messenger. And not thinking or feeling or doing or saying before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger have commanded us. Last but not least, there are many aims and objectives. Surah al Hujrat is a blueprint, it's a map, matrix, if you wish to use the word, for life, how to live among each other, <coughs> respect with Allah, uh, veneration of Allah. Respect to our brothers, our elders, our sisters, wives, husbands, and respecting of the soul. So these are some of, not all, the main aims and objectives of Surah Al-Hujurat. So Jazakum Al-Khair.
Um, a couple of times you said we don't have time, so we can adjust and be able to address it. You know, continue with the, that part after slot instead of trying to cram it in into 15 minutes because we don't want to miss out on any of the lessons <coughs> having you brothers here to be able to share this knowledge, to be able to bring this brotherhood together. So take your time. If you know, we all kill and that, that time comes, we're good. I mean, slot is at 4.30. So inshallah, everybody has a good rule. If you don't, many of you are traveling, so you probably double those that don't, you can start going, but I don't want to cut it short at all. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. This chapter of the Quran, as we have heard, it enters into the field of study, uh, as Sheikh Muhammad has mentioned, the Ulum of Quran, um, the, the academics of the Quran, the literature of the Quran. We commonly hear it translated as the sciences of the Quran, permanently. And this particular chapter, uh, as Sheikh Muhammad has mentioned, it happens to be a Medini chapter. And in this understanding, this chapter is aimed toward the believers. It is aimed toward the practicing Muslim. Meaning that within it, we are finding things that are relative to ourselves that as Muslims and as believers, things that we will observe and things that we may come into interaction with other Muslims doing if it is not ourselves. So then as we are contemplating upon this chapter and discussing it, we should not be looking at it with the lens of someone or something that is far away from us, but we should, we should be looking to our own selves and taking the admonition from it. Because we understand with the Qur'an, we, we learn tajweed, we learn the elocution of the Qur'an, the proper pronunciation of, of words in the Qur'an, but understand the goal behind that. The goal behind that is to get to the right word, so that we're saying the right word the right way. Once we are saying the right word the right way, then we are looking to the understanding of that word what that word means, or the phraseology, that grouping of words. And then once we understand what those words mean, then now we can take the admonition from it for, from ourselves, for ourselves. And then once we have taken the admonition from it for ourselves, the ultimate goal of the Qur'an is to act in accordance with its meanings, to act in accordance with the speech of Allah, the Barak wa Ta'ala, the best of the exalted. So with that, this opening verse here, it states, Ya ayyuhal ladina amun, O you who possess iman, O you who believe, O you who possess faith. Whenever we see this phraseology within the Qur'an, we understand from Ibn Abbas, may Allah be pleased with him and his father, that this is indicating something to us. This means that, more than likely, and quite consistently throughout the Qur'an, directly after it, there's either going to come a commandment or a prohibition immediately after this phraseology every single time. So then whenever we see it, now as a person of faith, we're looking for what has my Lord commanded me with? What is my Lord prohibiting me from so that I can act in accordance with the commandment or the prohibition? And as such, our Lord is calling upon us by the imam by the faith that is meant to be within our heart and spoken with upon our tongues and acted with upon our lips. So then here, what do we see as a commandment or a prohibition? لا تقدموا بين يد الله ورسوله Do not give precedence to anything before Allah and His message. So this is interesting because within this chapter here, we are being taught adab. We're being taught ethics within this chapter of the Quran. Islamic ethics. Islam has ethics, morals, manners, etiquette. And we're being taught here how do we interact with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So now during the time of the Sahaba, may Allah be pleased with them, then they are being taught 
quite naturally and directly to give precedence to him, to give to him before anyone else, to let him go first, to have him in, in the forefront. And us being many generations later, we understand that when it comes to our lives, we take the prophetic tradition of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we take his biographical account, we take his sunnah, we take his sirah, and we place that first in our lives before anything else. Not that there is not anything else in our lives, but we understand that we are taking the example from the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as Allah has decreed it to exist so that we can understand how do we interact with ourselves? How do we interact with others than ourselves? How do we interact with our Lord? All of this in a fashion that our Lord is pleased with. And here, we, we give a brief example. And uh, it, call, it brings to mind the renowned narration of Mu'ad ibn Jabal. May Allah be pleased with him. When um, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu dispatched him to, to Yemen, and Mu'ad ibn Jabal, he's being sent to Yemen to give da'wah, apologetics, invitation, to teach Islam to the peoples who were there at the time as Yemen was largely a Judeo-Christian state, and also to be a judge. So the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked Mu'ad ibn Jabal, what will you establish your hukum by way of? What are you going to judge with? So he says to him, Mu'ad ibn Jabal says to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I will judge with the Book of Allah. And what if you don't find it in the Book of Allah? Then I will judge with the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what if you don't find the judgment you're looking for there? He says then, I will exert my effort in legal opinion. And from here, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he, uh, he, he pats him on his chest and kind of encourages him and congratulates him and he says to him, all praise belongs to Allah, the one who has granted success to the messenger of the messenger of Allah وسلم, and what the messenger of Allah وسلم, is pleased with. What Allah and have taqwa of Allah, be conscious of Allah. So then, as we are giving precedence to Allah and his messenger, we are being mindful of remaining in a state of Allah consciousness. Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him, he mentions to us that taqwa, that God consciousness, or to be conscious of Allah, we commonly say fear Allah, it is al-khawf min al-jaleel. It is to fear the majestic. Wal-amal bi tanzeel. It is to act in accordance with revelation. And it is al-qina'a bil qalil. It is to suffice oneself with little. It is to dad li yawmu rahil. And it is to prepare oneself for the ultimate day of, of transport. In the Allah, Sameen Aleem. Certainly Allah is all hearing and all knowledge. Wallahu No, 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 I want you to. So what we can do is if we can start back, can we start back with you? Can we come back? Well, because Salah is at 4.30, huh? Okay. So, yeah, because I want, I don't want it, I don't want, I don't want like say, why you, we have you here, alhamdulillah, we appreciate having your brothers in, in, in this area, and the DMV, and being at this facility, so um, people have to make the room, we got time, so let's, Take the break when we come back, when we return, and finish off with these two brothers, and then we'll continue with the rest. Um, we're going to break for a salat. So. Alhamdulillah, we are back with uh, our program, Total to Hujurat, the Building Blocks of Brotherhood and Islam. Uh, earlier, we did the introductions. Um, 
and we had a, uh, we have a, another brother that's on stage, and um, he just joined us. Abdus Um He'll speak on um, that first item, what we went over. Uh, but after the man's day, the man's day is going to continue uh, with the program. We're going over the first side. Um, and then uh, we're going to have uh, Brother Yusuf going to be up here. So, um, everybody ready? Bismillah. Okay. So, you man. Bismillah. Wa rahman wa rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. So, alhamdulillah, we have a years because articulated very important points. Uh, I said they didn't leave blood on the bone. I just wanted to uh, emphasize uh, and interpret it in sport. That the context indicates meaning. And one aspect of context, the arrangement. With this verse coming first, one of the things you can understand is that it's a foundation that if you can't have proper etiquette of a dab, Allah, and the Messenger of Allah, Allah وسلم, and you put yourself forward before them, your opinion, ideas, whims, before what comes to us from Allah, the Quran, from the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before the Sunnah, Yet it has been a yet to let him or a school. The top of law, you know, why is he an anim? If we can have ada ada and etiquette and consider Allah the messenger, everything after that is going to pass. So, all of the subsequent rulings relating to how we deal with each other, uh, how we deal with rumors, scandal bumping, backbiting, all of these other things, we won't be stuck. Because there's no foundation. So that first verse is the foundation, and everything else is built on that foundation. If that foundation is lacking, then the other things just will be extremely difficult or they're, they're meaningless. Because either we're doing it out of some, as we would say, an ego trip, or we're doing it to give the appearance of being a people of adab and etiquette respect for the rights of others, but at the at the core, there's going to be some severe problems. It, it reminds me of this, of how some people, they're very enthusiastic about doing some things that most scholars would consider non obligatory So like the people, if they miss the Eid Salah, it's like their mother died. But if they miss Fajr, Aisha, it's like, mashallah. It doesn't bother them at all. And so, uh, just to, to illustrate the hadith, Abi Hurairata radiallahu an, and Abi Hurairata radiallahu an, an Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ima yarwihi an rab, an rabbi azza wa jal, an huqal min aada li wa liya, faqad adbantuhu bil hawa. So the point here, uh, whoever transgresses against one that I have brought into my assistance, my aid, my nearness, my love, for the meanings of the wilaya, I declare war against that transgressive party. My servant does not go draw close to me with anything more beloved to me than the obligations I've imposed upon him. If I extinguish the extension her, Arabic still used generic, Arabic is not really correct. Uh, and my servant continues to grow close to me with a voluntary act until I love him. So the point is, if we're doing the nawafid, the nawafid, but the the harp is neglected or even abandoned in some instances, then there's no taqarrub, there's no drawing near. And if we 
don't have the proper etiquette with Allah, the Messenger of Allah, then all of the niceties, or not even niceties, niceties but our, 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 what we display in our dealing with our brothers and sisters is going to be, have no foundation because the fundamental, foundational requisite of having the proper etiquette and respect for Allah and His Messenger Jazakallah uh, khair. We have um, Sheikh Abdul Samad. Um, Inshallah, and Sheikh Abdul Samad, if you can uh, introduce yourself uh, to the audience and also uh, provide a brief introduction uh, to Surah Al Hujurat, Inshallah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyid al-Khalq al-Jma'in, Muhammad al-Nabi al-Karim, wa ala alihi. Uh, respected brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, my apologies, I, uh, I joined a little late. Uh, so, my name is uh, Abu Abdul Rahman Abdul Samad Madad. I'm originally from Morocco, but uh, spent most of my time in America. So, I'm an Afro American, if you may say. So, uh, uh, I am the director of uh, the Institute Murtaqi. Institute is a health program, uh, homeschooling program, Arabic program uh, that's in uh, the area of uh, Lanham and uh, covering the area of College Park uh, and the, uh, the, all the area that is close by. Uh, uh, inshallah, I'm going to jump uh, straight to the topic and I'll start with the title. The title is The Building Blocks of Brotherhood. The building blocks of brotherhood starts with, first and foremost, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with in this surah. And that is what we call taqwa. If we don't have a taqwa, don't have fear and consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then uh, our relationship, our relationships will never be at the level Described by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us and prescribed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us and prescribed by the Prophet sallallahu So when you look at this surah subhanallah It's divided into eight sections. I'm sure it's just gonna give you a kind of uh, Mind mapping of the surah. It starts with Ya ayyuhal aman And this is a critical call to us as believers Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu wa arda, he said when every year in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, pay close attention to it. After that, it will be a prohibition or a command. Something that is critical in your life as a Muslim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with, first and foremost, our relationship with Him as the Creator. And He warned us against inventing in the deen. La tuqaddimu bayna yadayi Allahi wa rasulih means what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you is sufficient. So don't try to invent and come up with your own opinion and own say over the say of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first step. The second step in our relationship, in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our relationship with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the extent, to the extent that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, prohibited the companion of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from raising their voice when they are talking to the Prophet So just the voice لا ترفع أصواتكم فوق صوت النبي ولا تجهروا له بالجهر بالقول كجهر بعضكم لبعض أن تحبط أعمالكم وأنتم لا تشعرون If you raise your voice over the voice of the Prophet and speak to him loud in a way that harms or hurt his hearing وسلم, your deeds will be ruined now imagine, take that and apply it. The Prophet is not with us anymore. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But his life and his sunnah is with us. So raising our opinion over the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, would be similar to raising our voices over him Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam if he is alive. Which means that when the sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, comes to us, we have nothing to say but Sami'na wa atahni. We hear and 
to obey. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the third step talked about the deal in between us as believers and what to do and not to do. And then the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He without, subhanAllah, the aslub of the Qur'an, the, the style of the Qur'an is amazing. Without taking the characteristic of belief of the believers, even if they are fighting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اقْتَتَلُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمْ So if they fight, you can stop. Without Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taking the characteristic, they are believers, even if they fight, they remain believers. So reconcile, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to reconcile. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prohibited us from mocking one another and putting one another down and calling one another names and so on and so forth. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in building our relationship and strengthening and purifying our relationships, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us not to assume and not to have bad assumption towards one another and not which will lead, and we'll explain that later on, inshallah, will lead to major sins. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also remind the believers of their origin. After that, where did they come from? Adam and Hawa. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, emphasized that claiming to be believers is not enough, but to prove it with action. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concluded that surah with his uh, own knowledge um, so this is the basic, you know, framework and introduction to Surah al uh, that that uh, our guest has outlined for us today. And we're going to go through this framework, inshallah ta'ala, to try to benefit ourselves and our families and, and our communities. And I think, too, before we get into, I think, the first five verses of Surah Al-Hujurat, which can be connected, inshallah ta'ala, is that uh, many of the Mufassireen and the Ulamad, they also talk about the organization, right, of right, the Surahs, right, and why this particular Surah falls after uh, another Surah. So if we look at Surah Al-Hujurat, right, the Surah that comes before it, right, is Surah Al-Fatih, right, the, the conquest, refer, right, the conquest, referring to the conquest of Mecca, but if we look at right, the very last verse of Surah al right, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Muhammad Rasulullah, right, that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَارِ وَرُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُ Right, and those who believe, or those who are with him, who follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, they affirm with the disbelievers, but they have mercy amongst themselves. Right, and then this leads us right to Surah Al-Hujurat that gives us this uh, this this map, right, this framework, this this blueprint, right, of how we can actually apply this, right, in our lives in our society. Right, in fact, Surah Al-Hujurat. Right, it talks about the, this character of mercy, this character of mercy. Right, it comprises of five direct addresses to the believers. Right, this call that you hear, Ya Ladina Amanu, in this very short surah of 18 verses, right, it mentions Ya Ladina Amanu five times. Right, and it also mentions taqwa. Right, it mentions taqwa five times. Right, and it also mentions 10 prohibitions, right, within these 18 um, verses. So inshallah ta'ala, right, we are gonna touch a little bit on all of these areas, inshallah ta'ala, um, time permitted. So we wanna look at the, the first five uh, uh, verses, and I, I know that you know, there was some explanation to that in, in following the, uh, the, the Quran, following the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but we definitely want to um, hear a little bit more from our panelists about how we can actually apply that today in the 21st century, right? In the society in which we, we, we live in. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu la tuqaddimu bayni yadayi allahi wa rasoolihi wa taqru Allah inna Allah samiyun ma'aleen. O you who believe, be not, or do not uh, put yourself before by right, Allah, right, and His Messenger, and fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all known, all hearing and all known. 
يا ايها الذين امنوا لا ترفعوا اصواتكم فوت صوت النبي ولا تجهروا له بالقول كجهر بعضكم لبعض ان تحبط ان تحبط اعمالكم وانتم لا تشعرون O you who believe, do not lift your voices above the voice of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, nor speak loudly when addressing him, as you speak loudly to one another, lest your good deeds go to waste without you knowing it. Inna al-lazina yaruduna aswatahum inda rasulillahi ulaika al-lazina mtahana allahu kudubahum lit-taqwa lahum maghfiratum wa ajrun azim. Truly those who lower their voices in the presence of the Messenger of Allah are those whose hearts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has tested for their piety, for their taqwa. For them will be forgiveness and an immersed reward. Surely those who call out to you from outside your dwellings, most of them have no sense. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ صَبَرُوا حَتَّى تَخْرُجَا إِلَيْهِمْ لَكَانَ خَيْرُ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورُ رَحِيمُ And if they had been patient until you came out to them, it would have been better for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all forgiving, all merciful. Uh, so let's begin with those uh, five verses, inshaAllah ta'ala. And let's talk about how we can uh, uh, actually apply these verses right, to the Muslim woman today, inshaAllah ta'ala. Um, so any of our panelists, inshallah, you can jump right in. Zakum Allah for khair. Bismillah. Uh, the first thing that we uh, see in these few verses, and the first thing that catch actually uh, at uh, this surah, the beginning of this surah, is the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The call is specific to the believers. This, this part, this few verses, direct us as believers, those who believe in Allah, as their Lord and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as their message. The second thing is that, la tuqaddimu. Muqaddima means the beginning of everything or anything. So, which means, don't make in between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded or in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in front of the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't make your opinion, don't make your word over the word of Allah and the word of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What does it mean to us nowadays? And we see a lot of this, may Allah protect us. A lot of people will say that what happened during the time of the Prophet ﷺ is in regards or in accordance to the environment that was there. So it may not be applicable nowadays. And there are plenty of examples. Uh, in addition to this, People may say that we are in the Western world. This is a different, it's completely different. Sharia cannot be applied. The rules cannot be applied. They have to be manipulated a little bit. They have to be changed. And there are different conditions. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran, and he told the Prophet sallallahu when he talked to him, we have sent you to all mankind. And mercy to all. Mankind, including the jinn as well. So, rahmatan lil alameen. Not just to the people around you, which means in itself, it's the message embedded in there is that the Prophet is the last prophet. And whatever he came with should be applied and should be practical from then until the end of the time, until the day of judgment. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed also, following that, a test. What is this? It means it attests to you. You only be able to apply it if you have piety in your heart. If you are a true, sincere Muslim, you will be able to apply the rules of Allah and not to put your opinion over that, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead to the fifth verse. If anyone wants to circle back, the second verse. Yeah. 
and uh, they can do that. So Allah Ta'ala mentions again to the believers, Ya Ayyuhaladheen Aman in Jaha'akum Fasiqun Binaba'in Fatabayyanu Tusibu Qawman Bihalatin Bihala Wa Tusfiru Ala Ma Fa'altum Nadimeen So, all you believers, talking to us, if some corrupt source comes to you with some news, then verify it. Get clarity on it. So, in terms of our modern contemporary situation, uh, they have voice simulation software. They have facial recognition software. You know, they just had the uh, Hollywood. They still have it. The writers settled, but the actors are still on strike. One of the major issues is who's going to own their image, because they can take the image and then make a whole movie. So the, the bottom line, they, we've had problems between Muslims at a time we really need to, to be one unified uh, community against those who are, are against us. So they've had this uh, uh, sentence and it's created dissension and fitna because it wasn't verified, uh, it wasn't considered the facet the corrupt, profligate source that brought it, and it's created havoc. The Black Panthers were torn apart by redacted, like, FBI files, most of it was blacked out. And just from the, the snippets between what was redacted, they had people killing each other. We had the Alex Rackley murder in New Haven, Connecticut. It tore the Panthers apart. So when they have any of us giving a whole speech about some nonsensical, dangerous stuff. What are they going to be able to do if we don't take these uh, commandments, prohibitions, and this divine guidance seriously? We'll never be able to generate the critical mass necessary to save our people. At a time our people are literally drowning, the diseases of despair at an all-time high, alcoholism, Opiate addiction, heroin addiction, ecstasy, and all this stuff, suicide, at all time high, people are crying out for Islam, They're crying out for help. And the only help is the help that divine guidance is going to give them, the only pure source of divine guidance with the Muslim. That's why there's so much attention on getting in this area, getting the Muslim to get down with the LG. TQI plus agenda, getting the Muslims to uh, ease up on this and compromise that. So at a, at a time, you really need to have a unified stand. And there, there's always going to be khilaf on certain things, but really big things, they're going to be producing fake videos. They're going to be producing fake lectures. They're going to be producing things of some of us saying to others things we never said. And so if we don't take this serious and tabayyanu as a commandment, get clarity, clarify it, what's going to happen. And tosib will come and be jahalit, that you, you uh, uh, seriously wound and afflict people out of ignorance. Not out of knowledge, out of ignorance. And then when the truth manifests itself, it is too late, right? The damage is done on the front page with a picture. And the corrections on the back page with no picture and one little paragraph and no bold headline. But when the truth is manifested, and you will become remorseful over what you have done. So may Allah Ta'ala bless us to really take the, this advice seriously because we're heading for some interesting and unprecedented times. Things that have never occurred in human history are going to be occurring. Allah Ta'ala give us Tawfiyah. Amen, amen. The cross. Amen. And I want to just um, circle back around too because, you know, we're talking about the, the building blocks of, of brotherhood in Islam and, you know, for me, you know, as, you know, uh, a minute student of knowledge, when I hear these, you know, five verses, 
uh, these first five verses, I, I automatically think of leadership, right? About leadership and you know the leadership within the uh, the the uh, Muslim uh, communities, right? And how it was actually structured, right? During the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, right? And how is that organizational structure of leadership, you know, passed down, right? So. For the rest of the panelists, you know, can we tie these uh, first five verses into just leadership, you know, because again, it's, you know, uh, it's connected to, you know, Allah, it's connected to the message of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa right? And of course, that means, you know, the, the Quran and, and, his, and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So how important, why right, is that today, you know, with building uh, this, this, this framework of a brotherhood um, in Islam, inshallah? Bismillah, alhamdulillah. We're delving into the, the topic of, of, of leadership um, and to dovetail with what Sheikh Zaid was, was, was mentioning. It. And um, it really, really brings to mind where we're going now with artificial intelligence and stuff. Um, very risky business. Not that we can't benefit from it, but in some of the implications. Where, where we're at a point now where artificial intelligence already has the ability to mimic our voices, to mimic our images, and to create videos where it looks like us, but it's not us. Right? I don't know if, we, if, we, if we've seen this uh, cir circulate. Here's a uh, AI has mimicked the voice of Ben Bet. There's AI, you, you saw it, right? AI has mimicked the voice of Ben Bet, right? But it's not him. It's close though. Right? If you really listen to the shit, you know his voice. You can tell the nuances, but it's not far off. And uh, the next will remain, will remain nameless. But um, AI also mimicked a well-known Islamic personality in our country, an imam, and a well-known sister, right, prominent speaker. And then it mimicked a phone conversation between the two of them as though it was an expose. <laughs> Right? So, you know, to, to the Sheikh's point, I mean, we, we definitely have to be conscious. We definitely have to be conscious and verify as, as needed. Uh, so that's what off. As, as we they mentioned of earlier, and Sheikh Mohammed they mentioned of earlier, that this chapter, it is a, a Medini chapter. And it being a Medini chapter, it, it means that it was revealed after the Hijrah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, as he immigrated into Medina. And if we're speaking to the, the topic of leadership, we, we have to think about what was it that the Messenger of Allah began to put into place as he settled into Medina. And from here, what it brings to mind, I mean, all of us are well, well aware of the fellowship that the Messenger of Allah established between the Muhajireen and the Ansar, right? that, that fellowship and uh, in order to establish a society upon good standing, even in the beginning of it, he tied them so closely together that if one of them passed away, then the other was to inherit from the one that passed away until that was abrogated in order to get them set up. But when the Messenger of Allah is coming into Medina, a masjid is established, the first masjid of Islam, Masjid of Quba. They come into, into Medina. And of course, at that time, Quba was on the outskirts of Medina, but today it's included inside of Medina with the expansion uh, of Medina. So he enters into Medina, and from the first things that, that take place, we, we see that there's land. There's land owned by Salah and Suhail. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi purchases the land. And, um, there were some date palms and such. They clear some of that out, and they they build the masjid that is the Prophet's masjid as we call it today. And we understand from this, from a leadership standpoint of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that one of the first acts that he did was establish ownership, establish assets, establish endowments that can benefit Islam and, and benefit the Muslims. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam owned real estate. And after constructing that, we also see that he built homes for his wife. So he owned his home and he was able to provide 
shelter for his family. But uh, something else to mention about him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you go rewind the clock back a little bit further, and right before the Hijrah into Medina, right around the 11th year, the 12th year of the Bi'tha, of the, uh, the messengership of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you have the Bay'ah of al aqaba you have the pledge of the mountain pass, the first and, and, and in the second, where the, the Ansar, the residents of Medina are coming to make Hajj and things like that, and they're meeting with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they're embracing Islam. One year they come, there are about 12 of them or so, they come another year, it's about 70 of them or so, that come, meaning that it's even more than back in Medina, Musa'ab ibn Umair, is sent down to, to teach them and, and such. But uh, the point that we're looking to make is that they were negotiating and establishing what his leadership and the support of his leadership was going to look like in Medina. And one of the things that they agreed upon was as a part of his undertaking the governance of the Islamic State and the governance of, of Medina, was that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, would have the majority share in two of the primary commodities of Medina of that time, which was the date market and the gold market. So the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he had the majority share of control in the date market as well as in the gold market. And we have this idea that the Messenger of Allah وسلم, was like poor or something. He was actually wealthy. We, we know about his marriage with Khadija, may Allah be pleased with her, and the business that he did with her. But coming into Medina, wealth is increased. And in understanding this, what we're getting at is that if we're speaking to leadership, we're speaking to influence, we're speaking to establishing power. And at the base of power is economics, establishing an economic base for ourselves. And after an economic base is established, as the Messenger of Allah said, it did for himself and for the Ansar, as we see in the Sirah. After that, then we see that we need to enter into the judicial. We need to enter into the laws of the society. And we see that the majority of laws that are taking place in Islam, as many laws are here in Surah the Fajrah, are established during the, during the Medini period. And once now, we are shifting the laws to our favor, and we have the economic base to do so, because we can, we can employ, we can buy, we can rent or otherwise lease whoever we need to bend things so that we can live our lives in a wholesome way. Well, then we can move on to media, as we see with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu and is spreading the message of Islam outside of Medina. And if we get there, as we come to a close, then we can get to the last step in accruing power through the example of the leadership of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that's education. We, we need to be educated, of course, and we have this understanding that education comes first, and it's not that it doesn't come first, it's that we have to have everything in place to properly empower our education so that we can apply our education in the way that we want. Education without economics and finance, education without proper laws around it to support it, education without the media that is needed to spread the message so that we can control all narrative may not be as strong. All of this we see examples of in the life of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Inshallah, we um, have one more. Inshallah, uh, everyone else wants to speak about uh, leadership, inshallah, or? Very quickly. Uh, we can't divorce the issue of leadership from followership. Followership. Uh, because the, the two go together. Allah Ta'ala mentions in the Quran, and can Thus, he put some oppressors over others based on what they themselves have earned. There, there's a saying, Arabic saying, to translate it, if everyone in the kingdom had a beard, the king would have the longest beard. 
So the followers and educating so that we have an educated community will go a long way towards determining who to be. Anyone else uh, before we move to verse number six, if y'all would come back to any comments on that um, about leadership in general and specific to, uh, you know, Allah and this messenger, some of Allah Salaam. Assalamu alaikum First, as framing, we have been talking about tafsir and al-bab al uh, The commentary of this particular surah and also the reason why this surah was revealed. And they have done an excellent job. I don't want to be redundant, but in addressing what uh, the, uh, uh, Sheikh Yusuf said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayu alladina amanu wa atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul wa uli amri minkum fa in tanazaktum fi shay'in fa rutuhu ila Allah wa Rasul. This is a very, very important ayah because it addresses the believers again. He says, Ya ayu alladina amanu wa atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul. Obey Allah and His Messenger. Huh? And those in charge of you. And that is the next part that, that, that we have to be dealing with. We are those people that follow uh, uh, in those footsteps. And if you have any differences or any disputes, you would refer it to Allah and His Messenger. And lastly, uh, this, this uh, idea of, of uh, brotherhood has plagued us for many, many years, and it has a history. It doesn't mean we haven't attempted to bring about brotherhood in this country among the Muslims, but we have these things that, you know, Allah says in one ayah, this is one of the most devastating or dangerous things towards unity. Woe to every backbiter and scandal. And this is this is what, this we're gonna cover part of that in, in, in the six, inshallah ta'ala, so we'll come back to that, inshallah. And again, you know, um, important that even the Prophet ﷺ, you know, he said that if you hold on to two matters, right, if you cling to two matters, right, then you never go astray. And that is the Kitab Allah wa Sunnah al Nabi Wasallam, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of his Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, and he also says wa alaykum bi sunnati, right, wa Sunnah al Khulafa Rashidin Mahdiin, right, right. You have to follow my Sunnah and the Sunnah of the. Uh, the rightly guided uh, caliphs, Adu Aliha bin Nawajid, right? And that you hold on to it with your molar, with your molar teeth. Um, and I think, you know, it's very important too as, as we move to the next verse, um, is to look at the structure, the organizational structures as well. Um, because a lot of times with the organizational structures that we have in our Islamic centers and our masajids, right, the imams are employees. And a lot of times, you know, um, it's, it may be difficult, right, for imams to do certain things because, you know, they can get fired that they do something according to the Quran and the Sunnah, right? Or, you know, and, and we know that these things actually happen, but subhanAllah, and, you know, me as, you know, a, a business major and looking to organization structure, if you look at how the Christians structure their churches and the Jews structure their synagogue, Actually, their religious leadership, right, they are on top. They are the top tier. They make all the decisions. And up under that, they have a shorter a religious board that has some understanding, right, of their religion, right? And then the common folk, right, and the congregation, they handle administrative things. They pay the bills, for example. They collect the, you know, the charity, right? But as far as decision-making, right, if you look at their organizational structure, they start from the, by the people of knowledge, right? They are at the top of the, the organizational structure, right? And they make the decisions, right, for the community and not vice versa, like many of our Islamic centers and, and the massages actually do, right? So if we can actually look at that structure and how successful they're, they're, that, that they're doing, I think that our imma, our scholarship will be in a better position, um, inshallah, down, to make the correct decisions for, for the community. So let's move to the next verse, and uh, uh, Imam uh, Zayd Shaki, he, he touched on that. Uh, so we want to see if any of the other imma would like to talk about. Ya yuhamladina amanu, in ja'akum fasiqum binaba an fatabayyanu, an tasibu qawman bi jahalatin fatusfiru ala na fa'altum, 
Let all you who believe, if a person of evil character brings information to you, verify it, lest you do harm to some people in ignorance or out of ignorance, and afterwards repent, or you feel remorse of what you what you did. Um, so any of our imma, inshallah, I know, check out some of the would like definitely like to hear from you as well. Assalamu alaikum. Very important points mentioned. Very important points mentioned with regards to that ayah. Uh, in a brief context behind the ayah, as we mentioned, uh, siyak, the context gives you the desired meaning. And asbab uh, al reasons why verses were sent down when we talk about ulum al the academic study of the Quran. Many scholars have mentioned if not most, if not all, that this verse was sent down concerning one of the companions of the Prophet whose name was Walid ibn Ah, anybody know? What was his name? What's important is Walid ibn Mughira radiallahu anhu arda the story says is that the Messenger of Allah والسلام, he sent him back he sent him to collect the tax to one of the Arab tribes or Arabian tribes on the outskirts of Medina or outside of Medina. And the story states that um, some say Allah knows best is that he had some previous issues with this tribe. Some, as we would say, beef. You know, he had some problems. Somebody was killed, something was taken, etc. There was some friction. And there was some tension between him and the tribe towards he was sent to collect the sadaqah, to collect the zakat. So as he was traveling, and I don't know if anyone has ever been in the open desert. It's like, you know, the sea. You go deep sea fishing. Where you travel by boat and you can't see any land. Okay, now it's in the distance, but you can't see nothing but water, nothing. And the desert is very similar. You can be somewhere so far, so deep in the desert, and you see nothing but sand. Dunes and sand, that's it. So just imagine now, if, it's, if the skies are clear, there's no clouds, the sun is beating down on you. It's very hot. And when you're under the direct sun for a long, protracted period of time, sun can do things to you. It can make you exhausted. It can give you a fever, and I'll never ever forget the first time in my life that I experienced the phenomena of a mirage. Something that you see in a movie or a cartoon, or you hear about people literally daydreaming things. You see something, but it doesn't exist. First time this happened to me was many years ago. We were leaving Mecca, heading back to Medina. And anyone who's ever made a Hajj or Umrah, you're driving back in a car or a bus, you know that the roads are open, flat, and plain. There are no buildings, no rest stops, except for here and there. And of course, it's very hot. So it's so hot, you're driving on the road, if you look far enough, you see something that looks like what? Water. Looks like water. Literally, without any exaggeration. You look, you look, it looks like water. But the sun is so hot on the asphalt that it's nothing there. So as Walid radiallahu anhu was traveling with his companions and his entourage, he saw something in the horizon. What did he see? He saw something that was shiny, something that was metallic, something that was gleaming. And as they got closer and closer, he could see the people standing, like, you know, we said silhouette. He could see men, many men, many animals standing, and things that were shiny. And as he got closer and closer and closer, he said, wait a second, you see that? Those are swords. Those are swords and spearheads. So these people, this tribe, they have apostatized from Islam. They went, they've returned to Kufr, to Jahiliyyah, and instead of giving the zakat to the Messenger of Allah in Medina, they want to kill us. They want to kill me. They're coming to fight us. So the story says that Wali anhu, he left, he abandoned his mission, and he went back to Medina. And he told the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this tribe, they have kafaru wartadu. They have left Islam and they're willing to fight you, they're coming to fight you. So the Prophet Alayhi Wasallam, he's quoted to have asked him over and over again, are you sure about this? 
He said, yes, so let's pull out. We saw what we saw. We didn't, ima we didn't imagine it. It wasn't a mirage. We saw their swords gleaming. They were chanting. They were shouting. They were ready to fight us. So the Prophet والسلام, is quoted to have said that we don't wish to rush into fighting. We don't want to hastily take our arms against people that are supposed to be Muslim. But if they want to fight, then we'll fight. We aren't aggressors. We aren't hasty to spill blood. But we aren't cowards. We aren't punks. So if they want to come and fight us, then so be it. So um, a man, a delegate from this tribe, he went to Medina. And he said to him, he said to the Prophet where is your tax collector? We were waiting for him. We were expecting him to come, but he hasn't come. Where is he? Up to Arena. So obviously the Prophet is looking at this man, and he looks at him, you know, like, what happened? And he told him what happened. They said, no, we never left Islam. We're still Muslims. We love Allah. We love his messenger. We're willing to pay our tax. But your messenger, he left. All of a sudden, he just turned around and turned into flight. And then he explained to the Prophet Wasallam. This is a custom even to this very day, to this very day, among different Arabian tribes, uh, different countries in Africa. You can see this. When an esteemed guest comes, they don't allow the esteemed guest to come to them as we do. A conference or you say, oh, make a left there, make a turn there, and your hotel is there. No, 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 no. They're at the airport waiting for you. They're picking you up, carrying your bags. And um, I remember once, uh, it was the king of Morocco, he traveled to a, a sub-Saharan African country, and in the airport, before he got off the plane, the representatives of this uh, other African nation, right, which Brother Sheikh, you can tell me uh, better than you know about the custom, saw men with spears, shields, and the traditional tribal dress. They were dancing with their spears and their shields in the 21st century, because it's tradition. And when an esteemed guest comes, we go out, we meet the guests with our weapons to show the guests that you are protected in our tribe, our clan. No harm will fall upon you, you don't have to worry about anything. So this clan, they didn't leave Islam. Nor were they renegades and rebels. They wanted to welcome the Sahabi, and that was with their weapons. So he did see gleaming swords in the sun. He did see that. And he did see their horses in their camels. He did see the infantry in the cavalry. And he did see men that were full of morale and spirit. But he whether it was because of his personal problems with them, or the Olohanu, or whether he actually thought that they had left this land, he misinterpreted it. He was hasty, and he left, and he ran back to Medina telling the Prophet so and so forth. So this story of one of the Prophet's Sahaba, how easily information can be misconstrued, that half of the stuff is blocked out, it's not even a full sentence, it's not a full paragraph, but haste, as the Prophet Wasallam tells us, Patience, forbearance, slowing down, taking your time is from Allah. But haste and impulse, which is connected to the ego, that is from the devil. So you hear something bad about your brother, try your best to put the best possible interpretation on it that you can. He did this, he was there, he was caught with this woman. You sure? Step number one. But to bayan, but to thebatu. Double check, verify the information. Who said this? Who saw this? And I can tell you from my limited experience in life that most people who said that they saw or they heard or brother did this, when you stop and check them, you ask them, hey, were you there? Oh, no, I wasn't there, but you know, um, yeah. How many times that happened to you in your life? You told me that you were there. You told me that you saw them. Now, didn't see you. Didn't hear from the government. Who'd you hear from? Brother so and so. Brother so and so doesn't like him. He's his enemy. How can you take somebody who has hatred against another person, their face value statement about a person's enemy? So verifying the information is extremely important and it is utterly destructive to leadership and followership. And that's because the shaitan is busy. He wants to sow discord. He wants to use every single reason that he can to split us up, to separate us. As we will mention later on in the surah, race. Shaitan is going to use race to keep us divided. He's Arab, he's African, he's black American, he's this, he's that, he's Pakistani, he's Indian. He can't, you know. Why is he the leader from this race? Why is no, no one from this race have a position of power? And why and why and why and why? He's going to use these things. And he's going to use age. You're too young. You're too old. You don't understand. 
you're too young, you don't have enough experience in life. He's going to use gender. He's going to use wealth and status. He's going to use any tool to keep us splintered and keep us separated. So verify the information. And if you don't verify the information, you're going to play yourself. You're going to feel sorry. In most cases, you're going to do the damage that is irreparable. You said this about me, so on and so forth. I'm sorry. Okay. I don't accept the apology. Because you're supposed to know me. How many years have you known me? Would you, do you think about me like that? When I would say some nonsense, some foolishness? Do you think I would do something without no proof and evidence? That speaks volumes about how you look at me. The damage is done. You can apologize to your brother. You can apologize to your wife, to your husband. But the damage is done. You were cheating. And I know you were cheating. No, oh, that's not true. You didn't see. No, yeah, yes, you were. You were cheating. And then it becomes clear. This wasn't what I said. This wasn't a text message. That's not what I meant. I'm sorry. You know I love you. Woman, well, she's going to be scarred forever. You actually thought that I slept with another man being with you? You thought that about me? So be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Hello, hello. No, I'm Shana. Before um, we move on, uh, I'll check out if someone wants to comment. Uh, people who are parked on 97th Avenue, uh, they are giving out tickets. So if you parked on 97th um, Avenue, um, you know, please, I guess, remove your ribs for you. Your ticket. And I think too that, you know, this reminds me too, I mean, I guess 20 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, when um, individuals used to go abroad to um, get Fatawa from the Shiyuk. Um, and subhanAllah, and I think at that time, you know, people were still kind of, you know, the numbers of Arabic speakers and, you know, those that kind of understood the deen were we'll few, but alhamdulillah, we've matured, we've grown, right? And when you go back and listen to those tapes or, you know, read the manuscripts for those things, like, hold up, that's, that wasn't even the situation that happened, right? Or this person asked a question, you know, to the sheikh that wasn't even related to the, to the issue, right? So there was no verification process in that, and it really caused a lot of, you know, damage, you know, um, to the communities and splitting, you know, the hearts, you know, of, of the brothers and sisters in the communities and, and establish different, you know, uh, Islamic institutions, you know, because of uh, uh, this lack of verification, uh, 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 you know, within the community. Um, so it, it definitely can lead to blood, bloodshed and it definitely can lead to um, dividing the hearts, you know, of the believers. Um, so, Sheikh uh, Abdul Samad, uh, if you'd like to make a comment on um, this particular uh, verse, inshallah, and then we'll move on to it, um, to the next verses. Alhamdulillah. So inshallah, just a few words about uh, this verse. The first thing, and mainly leadership. In, in our, uh, we only have Islamic centers. That's, that's the only place where we meet and where we get together. And uh, We don't have the society that is the Muslim society. So, when the Prophet sallallahu uh, received the revelation, the first thing that was revealed to him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was the word iqra which means read which refers to knowledge and this is a crisis that we have a dilemma that we have in our leadership and that is the uh, I know so many of, of the leadership will not like it but the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the masjid is called the house of Allah the masjid belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not a business to be run as a business model. But he says the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which means it must be run through the rules of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Through the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam led the community. So the, the, the leaders, leadership must have knowledge before leading. Because if they run the masjid as a business, then who will not be successful, will not go forward. That's one. Two, another comment on the two recitation of this a word in this ayah, which is fatabayyanu and fatathabatu. A thabat means firmness. And at tibyan or bayan, clarity. So when you hear the news about someone that someone brought to you, then make sure that it's firm and it's clear before you judge that person. 
And when we judge as well, we know that the Prophet ﷺ lived in a society and around him there were hundreds of hypocrites. But the Prophet ﷺ never exposed them until they exposed themselves. The Prophet ﷺ only gave 12 names of all those. And you know how many they were? Just at the Battle of Uhud, there were 300. 300 of them that went with the leadership of Abu Lahab ibn Ubayn Salam. So the Prophet ﷺ was not concerned about those people more than he was concerned about them. So even if we hear something about someone that does not concern us most of the time, we should not be following, should not be believing, but we should be concerned about going forward in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, spreading the da'wah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because this is what's bringing us back. Such and such said, such, 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 such and such replied, and such and such said about him, and about and on and on and on and on, and our time and energy is wasted. So, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, in, in showing us these verses, and tusibu qawman bi jahala. Jahala, which means the jahala means transgression or oppression in this context. So don't transgress against someone because someone said that some such and such about that someone that you are not sure of. And it becomes a dhun, an oppression. And the last panel that says, Ya ibadi, inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharraman fala tazhalam. In the hadith Qudsi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ibadi, I made, O my servants, I have made transgression or oppression haram upon myself, upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I made it haram upon you. So don't transgress against one another. By judging someone based on news that you are not sure of and you're not clear about. Allah wa And um, again, just connecting it back to the science of the Quran and one of the so those sciences of the Qira'at, um, the different uh, variations of reading the Quran, and as uh, Sheikh Abdul Samad was mentioning, that the point was فَتَبَيَّنُوا This is uh, one reading, but there's another reading فَتَذَبَّتُوا right? So تَبَيَّنُوا means to, 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 to clarify تَذَبَّتُوا means to, to verify So these different uh, readings of the Quran that gives us you know, a comprehensive uh, understanding you know, of, of, of these verses uh, so this is extremely, extremely important. SubhanAllah, when we also look at, you know, uh, other stories in the Qur'an, uh, we know about Sulaiman alayhi salam, right? When he was, you know, checking on, you know, uh, you know his, his army, and he was checking on, you know, uh, the, the, the animals that were part, of, right, were part of that. And he didn't find which animal? He didn't find the, the hudhud, right? And you know, he's, you know, what's going on with the hood hood? Right? Where's the hood hood? Right? And when the hood hood right, came back and what? Right? With the news about you know uh, Bilqis, right? And her great uh, throne, right? What did uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala say? Or uh, on the tongue of Sulaiman, where Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Qala fa sanamduru asadakta am kunta min al kathibin." Right? We're going to see. If this person, or if you are truthful, or you are lying. So this is even Sulaiman alayhi salam with the, right, with the hood hood, you know, bird. Right. So imagine with human beings, right? Human beings, right? That you know their 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 blood is sacred, right? Their honor is sacred, right? Their wealth is sacred, and so forth and so on. So the verification process um, is extremely important. Uh, so we're going to go to the next, uh, I think the next two ayats uh, we can connect, inshallah ta'ala. No one uh, took those, but we are uh, keeping open for anyone that wants to make the comments on that, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ وَقَرَّهَا إِلَيْكُمُ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفُسُوقَ وَالْعِزْيَانِ أُولَٰئِكَ أُمُّ الرَّاشِدُونَ فَضْلًا مِنَ اللَّهِ وَنِعْمَةً وَاللَّهُ عَلِيمٌ حَكِيمٌ
So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and know that the Messenger of Allah is among you. If he were to obey you in many matters, you would surely be embroiled in trouble. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the faith dear to you and adorned it for you in your hearts and has made disbelief in wickedness and disobedience hateful to you. Such are those who are rightly guided. This is a bounty and a grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. So any of our panelists, inshallah ta'ala, if you want to um, comment um, on um, this verse before we move to uh, verse number verse number nine, inshallah. And I know there's you know, many things that can be that can be said. Right? Any volunteers, inshallah? Uh, first of all, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will start with the end of the ayah. And I will comment on the end of the ayah, which says, uh, the, the last part of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and actually the beginning of the ayah talks about if we, if, if the Prophet وسلم, obeys you in all the matters, which means Haste and take decisions and answer questions, then you will be in big trouble and difficulty and hardship. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when the revelation comes, when a prophet, the Prophet is asked a question, the Prophet never rushes to answer. Never rushes to answer, but he would wait for revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to him most of the time. To the extent that he will wait for days and weeks before the revelation came, came come to him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as we know in the event of the three questions that the Prophet sallallahu was asked about the Qarnayn and the Fitya of the Surah Al-Kahf and Ar-Ruh in Surah al -Isra. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Allah subhanahu wa taala, is telling the companions if he listens to you and he does what you want, then you will be in trouble. At the end of the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa taala says. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made Iman beloved to you and beautified in your hearts and make you hate disbelief and mischief and disobedience and then those are the rightly guided ones and then Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'mat and this is the, the point I want to make in here Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'mat what the ayah that comes after this refer to this as well Fadl is bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ni'mah is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So whatever we achieve when it comes to our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the beginning, from being a Muslim, from being able to say La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, into performing our salah, fasting, making our hajj if possible, giving zakah if possible, and so on and so forth, any good deed that we do. It's all a fadlun min Allah. It's a bounty from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a bounty. You have to think, think deeply about it. Allah could have chosen someone else than me to be a Muslim. Because there are billions of people out there that are not Muslims. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose me to be a Muslim, upon la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, this is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me that I have to be grateful for. And then, under this, comes the relationship. If we look around us, and we ask each and every one of us, where are you from? Which country you're from, or origin, or nationality? We'll find at least 20 to 30 nationalities. Why are we here? Why are we together? Except that we are under La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, as, as a bounty and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as brothers and sisters. There's nothing between us, no business, no blood relationship, nothing. The only thing that is, that is connected us is that my, you are my brother and you are my sister. For the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything 
that we can we do in our life that looks good, then it's a bounty and blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not our effort. It's not our intelligence. It's not our smartness. It's not our wealth. It's not our degrees. No. It's the blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fadlan min Allahi wa ni'mah. It's a bounty and a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah. Just quickly, uh, a point was made earlier. I think about the uh, ayah, the, the prophet being lifted from the first verse. And here they're saying, Lo, we feel for you. The hearing men are to obey you because you want your opinion to be before that, or even before that. Know that the Prophet is a monk, so his sunnah, his example, his is, is still with us and will be with us. But his physical presence isn't with us. But physically, Sheikh Ali mentioned. يا أيها الذين آمنوا أطيعوا الله أطيعوا رسول وقول الأمر منكم أبي الله أبي المسيح and those in authority and also أقول الأمر العلماء والأمراء the scholars the legitimate political authority so that that same obedience is owed to them العلماء ورثة الأنبياء scholars are the heirs of and, and so we should respect legitimate authority, not illegitimate authority. We should respect legitimate scholarship and not desire to put ourselves forward in our opinions in the, in the, in the face, goes back to leadership, of legitimate authority and of legitimate uh, scholarship. So, and, and if we do, we're going to get into a lot of trouble. But it's faith that prevents us and restrains us. Allah has made faith to be known. He's made this made uh, moral uh, corruption, he's made rebellion and sin. Hate it to you. And that's what restrains us. So the 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 community building that this the brotherhood, sisterhood, by extension, that this chapter is dealing with is really talking about the foundation of a community. You see this theme of faith and not not following one's vain desires. Uh, being the foundation for our communities. It's very quickly a, a, another verse that kind of summarizes, not summarizes, complements this chapter is the last verse of Surah Al Hashr. When the Dina Tabawa Yara, what Iman and Al Kabi, Hibbuna and Hajar Ayli, Wala Yejidu fi Sururi, Hajat and Mimma Utu, Wil Firuna and Fusian, Wala Kanabi and Hosas. وَمَنْ يُقَى شَحَ نَفْسِهِ فَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ That those who inhabited the abode, the Ansar, and attained the faith before them, before the Hajirin came to them. يُحِبُّونَ مَنْ هَاجِرَ إِلَيْهِمْ They love those who migrated to them. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي شُرُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُ They find no envy and jealousy in their hearts for what the others have been given. And they give preference to others, even though they themselves have serious need. And whoever can restrain himself and the greed of their soul and their selfishness, they will be the ones who will be successful in, in establishing this community. So the faith and iman, the faith. In those sharing the abode and the, the faith of those 
who without faith and with, without and who might love corruption and disbelief will, will, will put their opinions and encourage the leadership to obey them without any knowledge and then fall into a lot of difficulty and trouble. So these are these are foundations again for establishing a sound, vibrant, prosperous community. Allah give us no peace. I mean, I mean, uh, but we're going to uh, move to verse number 9 and 10, uh, and we're going to have Imam Ali, inshallah ta'ala, to make the initial commentary uh, on 9 and 10, inshallah ta'ala, since there, uh, one is basically, uh, you know, the a continuation of the other, uh, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ اَقْتَتَبُوا فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا فَإِن بَغَتْ إِحْدَاهُمَا عَلَى الْأُخْرَى فَقَاتِلُوا الَّتِي تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَبْغِي حَتَّى تَفِيهَا إِلَى أَمْرِ اللَّهِ فَإِن فَأَتْ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا بِدْعَبْنِ وَأَقْسِتُوا إِنَّ اللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُقْسِتِينَ In the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and if two parties of the believers start fighting, they make peace between them. And if one party of them oppresses the other, fight the oppressors till they return to Allah's ordinance. Then if it, if, if it returns, or if they return, set matters right between them, equitably, 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 equitably and to be just. Surely Allah loves those who are equitable. Uh, most certainly the believers are brothers, so make peace between your brothers and Observe your duty to Allah so that the mercy may be shown to you. Um, first, let me, let, me, let me just close out on what uh, Sheikh uh, Zayd was saying. It's an ayah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhil ladhina amaru tukuru fi silmika fa wala tattabiru kutuwaat al-shaytan innahu lakum abubun. Oh, you will believe when you enter into silmi ma'ana is Islam. Wala is just, you know, completely, wholeheartedly, meaning you didn't have a gun to your head. I mean, you know, no one is forcing you to do it. La ikraha fi deen kattabayin al-rushtu min al-ghayt. There's no compulsion in this deen and truth is distinct from error, but this ayah is saying, you know, if, if, if when you enter this thing, you have to be whole, you have to be completely understanding of what you're doing and you have to grow that understanding with knowledge. Now, uh, my dear nephew, <laughs> I'm gonna move down to the next one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm gonna jump from because the, the brother wanted to, to it's in the we know the echo. This is uh, relating, I think, as Baba Moses was about Ben Tamim, when that um, uh, it was about the one had married uh, 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 his wife and they locked her up and they wanted they couldn't allow him to see the family. And they came and they took her and the fighting began, but they were using slippers, slanders. They were not using swords or anything like that. But in the we know the echo, this is one of the issues we face today. That verily, indeed, we are a single brotherhood. The believers are a single brotherhood. As the Prophet says, uh, This is uh, what is Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, I think uh, Sheikh Nasruddin al Albani he graded it as Hassan, as a good hadith. And then there's another hadith that is collected by Imam Muslim, he said, uh, uh, okay, so the believers, not only including, was not including just the, the, the average individual, but the NBA, one more city. They all are considered believers. So this brotherhood is not just you and I, but it included all those Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent as prophets and messengers and people, uh, 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 the salihun, the salihin, the righteous people, uh, the who believe, and and we have to we come to a situation wherein uh, we differ. We have to we have to make amends. 
you know, and, and, and by making amends, some of us have to give up that selfish power for a greater power and understand that Islam, that we refer to Allah and His Messenger before anything. And our decisions that we make are well, we refer to Allah and His Messenger before anything. So, and if we as Muslims we are going to remain as brothers, then that is, has to be the pinnacle that, that drives and guides us to, to, to a greater unity. And we haven't witnessed unity completely in this country yet, but inshallah, victory is on the other side. We see it, and inshallah, we know we have the text, we have, we have, the, we have the Allah's book, and we have the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Sunnah, but we as Muslims, we have some things to work out, to iron out, inshallah. We intend to receive Allah's mercy and we have to work very hard to try to make some brotherhood come about, inshallah. Inshallah, inshallah too, we want to get um, Imam Aqil, you know, back into um, this, this conversation, especially about, you know, um, these verses. Uh, but I think that, you know, um, you know, this is definitely the framework of, of, of conflict resolution. Uh, conflict resolution that requires arbitration. Right, because if you look at these verses, it's talking about two parties, right? Two different parties. But the verse says for aslihu, right? It is a command in, in, in the plural, right? And also in the next verse, it says the same thing for aslihu. So that means that there has to be another party of people involved to help rectify, right, this dispute, right? And this is what we call the, the um, arbitration, right? And, the, and, and this is how we can actually. Um, you know, resolve, you know, the conflict between these two parties because a lot of times as Muslims, whether we have a dispute between brothers in the community or between different communities or between, you know, husband and the wife, right, we sometimes feel ashamed, right, as Muslims to go out and seek that arbitration because we don't want anyone in our business, right, but based off of this verse, some of the other men mentioned that this is part of the key fight, right, the arbitration process it is a communal obligation, meaning that if it's not resolved right by that third party, right, then the community can fall fall in sin. Well, no, I love so. Yeah, Machila, if you want to make any commentary on uh, the verses of Allah Taala about rectifying and brotherhood, Inshallah Taala, uh, before uh, moving on, Inshallah. Well, what what comes to mind? If we're going to speak to the verse that Sheikh Ali is mentioning, in the Malhamununa Ikhwa, this is certainly the believers of brothers. Before we can talk about that and what you're mentioning, we have to be mentioning the, the, the language that we find in Islam and the Quran and the Sunnah. Uh, often we may find that it is pointed toward the male gender, and we may think that somehow it is excluding the female gender. If it says brothers, it's not including sisters. That's not necessarily how our sharia is set up. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi he makes a statement, and the statement that he makes is also a qa'id of fiqiyah, it's also a legal maxim. In Nisa, shiqa'id qurrijal. Women are the twins of the men. So the meaning here is that anything that applies to men in Islam by default and automatically applies to women in Islam unless we have a specific text that would direct us otherwise. So when we're speaking to brotherhood, by default it means sisterhood. And here in this verse when our Lord states, certainly the believers are brothers, it also means that believers are sisters to one another as well. That's first. And secondly, we understand that our brotherhood is premised upon Iman, our fellowship, our sisterhood is premised upon our, our faith. And our faith is premised upon our belief in Allah and our belief in the last day and everything that is connected to that. That doesn't require that I personally like you or you personally like me in order for us to be brothers and sisters to one another and give rights to one another. That's in the front. And if we understand that, we understand that we are meant to be dutiful to each other, whether we personally like one another. 
Now, when it comes to this matter of salah, and I won't be too long, but when it comes to this matter of, of reconciliation, this does speak to the fact that we have different perceptions of things, and we have different experiences with things. Um, why don't we do a little bit of psychology for a minute, Tom? Really quickly, I'm, I'm looking to see what we kind of have around here. I don't know what, what we have around here. No, time, and time has been extended, huh? Yeah. All right. What is this? What do you see? A magazine? Pamphlet? You say what? Again? Okay. What color do you see here? Red. Red. Right, white, blue, okay. What if I said this is a green book? I'm lying, I'm lying. Here we go, let's, let's do it, right? Uh, that's my opinion, right? Okay, so we're gonna do this exercise. This is gonna tie into the salad, to reconciliation. Um, they say he's gonna stole my thunder and all that. See that? <laughs> they was calling me a liar. I had him. I had him. <laughs> so, so there's something that's called cognitive complexity. And, and it's the idea that we can have an experience, but because of the side of the experience that we're on, we think our side of the experience is the, is the whole of that experience. And the person on the other side of that, what they see, in my case, oh, I was gonna tell you that, you know, call me all type of names and all that that it actually is green, but that's what I see, right? And when we're communicating with one another, we need to understand that others may have a different perspective than we do, and we need to attempt to see things from their perspective before coming to conclusions, right, on that perspective. And this is something that, that enters uh, into our, our study of Islam broadly, our academics, and it enters into fit particularly, interest into law particularly. When you have differences of opinion, differences of opinion are of two types. You have ikhtilaf at tudad and ikhtilaf at tanawwar. You have a difference of opinion that's in opposition one to the other. For example, one is saying permissible, the other is saying impermissible. Right? There's that clash there. And then there's another type of difference. Ikhtilaf at tanawwar, difference of varying, varying view, right? or cognitive complexity where people are talking about the same thing, but they're speaking about it from different sides or different perspectives of that same thing. This is the majority of difference of opinion that exists in Islam, and it's the majority of difference of opinion that exists amongst humanity broadly. And scholarship mentions to us that ikhtilaf to no one, that this difference of varying views, it you feed and it benefits knowledge. Because having different perspectives, it adds on and gives us a more holistic picture of what's taking place, right? So when we, if we have to come into Islam, if we have to come into reconciliation, it's often because of the fact that we have different perspectives about a same thing, right? And we need to get on that, on that same page. So then the hope of the, of, the, of the arbitrator is that the arbitrator is able to see what both sides are seeing, and then bring it into some way of coalescing between the two parties so that they can move forward and work together for whatever is that, for whatever that is. But, Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah Khair, and um, you know, I wish we can, you know, to stay on this, 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 you know, th these verses you know, inshallah. Um, so we'll have, you know, I'll check out, I'll go somewhere I want to, to add, because again, this is the, the question of the, the whole uh, panel discussion is, you know, the building blocks, you know, of, of brotherhood, so inshallah. Uh, I, I would just want to add uh, some linguistic, uh, inshallah, thoughts about this verse, specifically this verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, starts the, uh, the, the, the ayah, the verses, with, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٌ in Nama, in the Arabic language, it's called for al hasr wal qasr al hasr wal qasr al hasr means to put limitation. And al qasr this and nothing but this. Maqsura, which means specific to this. 
which means the type of relationship that we have, uh, that we should have and live by, is the type, the brotherhood and the sisterhood. I'm going to contradict my brother Atil. I'm sorry, I love you for the sake of Allah. He said that even if he, I don't like him, you cannot live without liking me. You have to love me, which is more than that, to be brothers, to be true brothers. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us, the Prophet swear. He says, by Allah, you will not enter Jannah until you believe. And you will not believe until you love one another. When, for example, when we don't like that person, we don't, it's not that we don't like the person, we don't love the person, we don't love the, what the person does of innovation or uh, something wrong with sin or this and that. We don't love the action of the brother or the action of the sister. But that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He say, said in this ayah, فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ That brotherhood and إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ أَخْوَةٍ وَإِنْ طَائِفَتَانِ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Do not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that these two group of people are fighting, reconciled between them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even they are fighting, they are disobeying Allah and disobeying the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi did not remove the characteristic of Iman of them. He left them as believers and فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخَوَيْكُمْ Those are your brothers and our sisters, reconcile between them. For what? The purpose is at the end of these ver these two verses or these first if you want to be if you want to be encompassed by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why is it important to have the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? What what happened to the shaitan? What is la'na? Shaitan is saying la'na Allah. So he was kicked out of the mercy. So to be under the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we must apply We step over our egos, we step over our opinions, and we stand and hold on to the opinion of Allah. Ya Allah wa Rasulih and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Sorry for taking it down. SubhanAllah, when you look at this even today, you know, as we are still, you know, healing some of our wounds in the community, right? It reminds me of, you know, this movement of takfir, you know, this making believers, you know, disbel uh, making believers disbelievers, right? And removing them from, from the midhats. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, again, giving us that framework, right, of to rectify, you know, our fears, right? We are still believers, right? We're still brothers, right? And we may dispute, right, in, 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 in private. We may debate, you know, in, in, in the private, but in public, right, we have to show, right, ourselves to be, you know, one, to be one, to one, to be one body, right? And our brothers and our sisters, they have rights, right, over us, right? And we have duties, you know, to them. Right, and again, it is connected to our iman. None of you truly believe until you love for your brother that you would love for for yourself. And I think we want to move to the next one because I know you're you're heading. You're, uh, you're the uh, initiate the conversation with that one, or you have have some commentary on that too. I was just going to say for the for the summit mentioned just about the brotherhood belief remain and how important the love and mercy are. In the love it's a comprehensive mercy. All of you. Show the method of meaning. The likeness of the believers. So this this chapter many times is eight times. يا أيها الذين آمنوا يا أيها الذين آمنوا 
the likeness of the believers, and their mutual love, and their mutual mercy. Talking about the mercy, and the emotional ties they share, but just said, like a simple body. So may Allah Ta'ala bless us with the awareness and consciousness and understand the importance of maintaining those things despite the worst of scenarios. The worst of scenarios that physically fight it. But despite that obstacle, may not come. And ta'ifatun min al وَإِنْ فَعِفَّتَانِ مِنَ الْمُحْتَوْهُ أَصْلِهُ بَنِهِ I'll give us the So I'll leave it to you. Two things. One is, uh, we, I know we have scheduled to talk about at the end of the 6.45, so they extend it with the Salah time uh, uh, <coughs> coming in. But also, just wanted to, with the session, I said, in my mind, in my heart, I said, we'll be in my heart, we'll talk a lot. So, um, one of the things of having this time, having that uh, first hand, is responding to what our, what our creator said. You know, um, I always ask people when somebody says something, yes, this person said that, I said, I'm Rabbi. And you say, okay, what be your Rabbi? Qala Allah hadha? Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam hadha? Man qala hadha? Who said it? Messenger said it. So they said, oh no, somebody said it. So man, who are Rabbi? That's your Lord. So if our Lord says something, then that's it. And we always talk about these questions when we ask in the grave. Man, the Rabbi, who's your Lord? When you respond in the grave, it's going to be how you lived your life. Who you made your Lord in your actions, your decisions, and all that. I think that um, this is a good segment for us to pause, inshallah ta'ala, with the concept of brotherhood, and then we will come back and we will, uh, after Mangal, inshallah, we will uh, finalize the, the last few verses of Surah Al Qajarat. Bismillah ar Rahim, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam, ala Rasulullah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah ta'ala, we are going to uh, move. Uh, a little bit uh, more swiftly, inshallah, I'm going through the next uh, set of verses, uh, and we are going to begin uh, with uh, verse number 11, um, inshallah ta'ala, and then uh, we have a little commentary on that, and then we will go uh, right into uh, verse number 12, and uh, Sheikh Abdul Samad is going to uh, start off uh, by talking about that. Um, so verse number 11, um, it reads, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amadu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asai yakunu khayran minhum wa la nisa'un min nisa'in asai yakunu khayran minhum wa la talmizu anfusakum wa la tanabazu bil alqaq bi'sa lismu al-fusuk ba'd al-iman wa man lam yatub wa udaika umu al-wadimun um, so the verse of reason when you believe, let not any group mock others who may not be better, uh, who may be better than uh, they are, nor let women uh, mock other women who may be better than they may be better than they are. Do not defame one another, nor call one another by hurtful nicknames. Sinful is the ascribing of a bad name after embracing the faith, and whoever does not repent these are the evil doors. Um, so inshallah ta'ala, Imam Andi, if you want to uh, just uh, initiate the, the commentary, um, inshallah ta'ala, on this particular verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling upon us as well, again, 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts this ayah with, Ya ayyuhal amanu, which means pay close attention to it. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. La yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khayran minhum. Don't let a group of people mock another group of people and of believing men and women. Maybe they, they, they are better than them. The mockers or those who are mocked are better than, than, than those who mock in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, sometimes we may look at people and we look down at them. And because they are not well dressed, they are poor, they don't have a better degree than us, they don't have a better social status than us, they don't have more knowledge than us, we have more knowledge in some certain things, in certain, uh, though the knowledge is, no matter what you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send someone who knows better than you. And we look down upon them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladina amal la yasma. And la here, it's for that which is haram, which means prohibition. La an nahiya. La an nahiya. Do not. Do not mock one another. Do not mock others. Other believing. Man, for whatever situation they are, for whatever status they have, do not mock them. Why? Because you may find yourself worse than them when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or your situation, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may be worse than yours. But yours will be worse than them in, 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 in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amalu la yaskhar qawmun min qawmin asa an yakunu khairan minhu. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in this specific act. It is, it is divided or distinguished between the command to the man and the command to the woman. So in this ayah and all the other ayahs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about all you will believe, including man and woman. In this specific ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Don't let a group of men mock another group of men. Because those who are mocked, they may be better in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than those who are mocking them and looking down upon them. وَلَا نِسَاءٌ مِّن نِسَاءٍ عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُنْ And not let a group of women mock another group of women because of their race, because of their color, because of their ethnicity, because of their uh, social status, uh, financial status, uh, knowledge, whatever it is. Do not mock one another. Do not let a group of women mock another group of women. عَسَىٰ أَن يَكُنَّ خَيْرًا مِّنْهُنْ وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَلْمِزُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ And he did not say, uh, do not uh, do not call one another names and uh, do not insult. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not insult yourselves. Do not insult yourselves. And when we look at this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, do, do not insult yourself. Why? Because what was said in the previous ayah is, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةٍ Believe in men and women, are brothers and sisters. And if you insult someone, you are insulting yourself. Your own brother who is like you, your own sister who is like you. So you are insulting, don't insult yourself, and don't, وَلَا تَنَابَزُوا بِالْأَلْقَابِ Don't call one another. Names because this may lead and this is specifically what we see nowadays that this person is a Kafir, this person is out of Milla, that this person he made a mistake or he committed a sin, he's out of the deen and so on and so forth. You may fall, billah, as the Prophet told us, uh, if a Muslim called his brother or sister a disbeliever then one of them has to take the title. One of them has to be. If you call someone a disbeliever and he's a Muslim, then you're left the fold of Islam and Iyad If he is a disbeliever, that's fine. Then you are safe. But if he's not, then it falls on you. So one of them has to take it as the Prophet ﷺ taught us. 
ولا تنابزوا بالالقاب بئس, بئس الاسم الفسوق بعد الايمان. And after this, Allah سبحانه وتعالى he, he says this if it happens in case it happens the door of repentance is open. If you if you if you have or if you if it happened that you fall into this sin of calling others names, the sin of mocking your brothers or your sister in Islam, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, which means the door of repentance is open. But if you don't open, then you are oppressing. You are an oppressor. Or among the oppressors, oppression who? Oppressing your own self. Because you will have to pay for this on the day of judgment. There is no dinara ala dirham. There is no dollar, no cents. But there is good deeds and bad deeds. Allah preserved them for us. Wallahu ta'ala ala alam. Inshallah. I think important too that during the time of the Prophet you know, they used to uh, mock uh, some of the companions of the lower class, uh, that lower class maybe from, from wealth or because of their family status, like, you know, Bilal or Ammar, Suhail, um, and so forth and so on. But you know that, you know, this is, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting us from, from this verbal abuse. Uh, from these hurtful uh, words, and Muslim and Salman Muslimuna min lisanihi wa yadihi. That a true, the true definition of a Muslim is who other Muslims are safe from, right? The tongue, right, as well as the hands. And this is uh, actions that require toba. And if it requires toba, then this is, these are from the Quebec, right? These are from the the major, you know, sins. Right to uh, defame, right, and to slander, right, and to call people by names that they actually dislike. These are from the Quebec, and these Quebec, the Quebec, it requires Toba, right, to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, asking Him, right, to to forgive. And even this condition, when you're hurting, you know, someone else, right, then there's a fourth condition of the Toba, and you have to um, get the forgiveness of that person that you that you actually uh, that you actually harm. I think um, Imam Akut wants to make um, some comments, inshallah ta'ala, and then we'll move to the, to the next verse. This section, it, um, it, it brings to mind the statement of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, So he's done. <laughs> to revile another Muslim is immoral. To revile another Muslim is an act of a degenerate, and to fight another Muslim is kufr. Is disbelief here meaning that it is a major sin? And really, what this set of verses in this prophetic tradition is bringing us in the mind of, it is bringing us in the mind of emotional intelligence. That when we're speaking to fellowship, brotherhood, and sisterhood, sisterhood we need to be conscious of our emotions, of the emotions of others, and the impact that our words can have on, on others. Because if we are in a space where we just have negative interactions with one another, then how can we build the community we're looking to build? How can we build the master we're looking to build, the institutions we're looking to build, our state in place in society that we're looking to take. You follow? Does that make sense? And uh, in this regard, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he stated, وَلَا And do not have hatred one of you for the other. Meaning, do not be a cause of hatred one of you for the other. Ibn Akik al-Eid, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he, he mentions here that love and hate are two emotions of the heart that the servant doesn't truly have control over. And this is understood from the fact that the Messenger of Allah said, has told us that the hearts are between the uh, between the, the fingers of Allah Rahman, he turns them however he wills, right? So if this is the case, then we can't truly control the emotion 
But if we look at the prohibition of the Messenger of Allah he's stating do not cause hatred. Because once it's there, it's there, you can't control that, right? That's in your heart. But what we can control is the things that will cause us to love one another, the things that will cause us to hate one another, so then we focus on that. And if we are reviling one another, then it's quite obvious that this can be a cause for us to have hatred for one another. And if we have hatred for one another, then we won't have love for one another. And then we revert back to the hadith that we heard earlier, that none of you will enter into Jannah until you have Iman, and none of you have Iman until you have love for one another. So all of this is connected in that way. We thought that we should share it. That is love. Um, I just want to mention, you know, when the Prophet ﷺ, when he was in the in the plains of Arafah, uh, he addressed the, the the congregation. He says, "Ayuhannas, inni la atri la ali al mihada bi hada mawkif abadan." He says, "I don't know whether or not I'll be here with you the following year." In this place ever again. He says, Inna dima'akum wa amwalakum haramun alaykum ka hurmati yawmikum hai, fi shahrikum hai, fi baladikum hai. I mention this because, because uh, 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 the, you know, hurting, hating, or saying bad things to what people leads to bloodshed. And the Prophet says that your, your blood and your property is sacred. As sacred as this day of it, which was Yom al Nahr, all the Zul Hijjah, Yom al Nahr, the tenth of the Zul Hijjah, fi shahrikum hada, in the in the month of Zul Hijjah, which is one of the Hurm months, and fi baladikum hada. Of course, we're talking about Me Mecca and, uh, and the surrounding areas. So, but my point is, is that these were these were this was in the last year of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's life, and his concern was that we not strike the necks of one another. And once you start uh, speaking ill and bad and calling names, of it, next thing in these, I don't know, I know in grade school, someone called by my name was a fight. It was very rare to go to fight. And it's that, that way in, in, in real life. When you start calling people names, it hurts. People say, six and stone may break my bones, but words never hurt. That's a lie. That's a lie. When someone say the right thing to you, you can start a war. So our blood and our properties are sacred. So we cannot be forward or attack one another on these bases or call people names. The Prophet says, don't say, oh, you little one, little one, if the person doesn't appreciate that name. So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, let's, let's, not, uh, let's not use these things that are haram. In the haram, you know, in the halal. Whatever is haram is clear, and whatever is, is uh, halal is clear. So, mashallah, uh, Shaykh al Hussamid brought it very well. And the point you made, again, alhamdulillah, should be reiterated again because we forget that soon we walk out of here. Just like it's not happening. Inshallah. Now, I think we're going to touch on it a little bit more too in the next verse, in verse number 12, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayu ladhina amanu, istanibu kathiran min al-van, inna ba'da van li ithi, wa la tajassasu, wa la yaktab ba'dakum, wa la yaktab. بعضكم بعضا ويحب أحدكم أن يأكل دعم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه فاتقوا الله واتقوا الله إن الله أواب رحيم. So Abdus Shah Abdul Samad, inshallah Taala, is going to continue the commentary on verse number twelve, and then we'll move to move the for verse thirteen, inshallah. Another time again, يا أيها الذين آمنوا. Another call from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those who believe, the true believers. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu jitanimu kathira min al-dhan inna ba'd al-dhan ism wa la tajassasu wa la yaktab ba'dukum ba'da ayuhibbu ahadukum an yakula lahma akhihi maytan fakarihtumu wa attaqu Allah inna Allah tawabur rahim Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this First, as he mentioned in the Quran, وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ Don't follow the footsteps of the shaytan because it's going to lead you to destruction. It's going to lead you to major sins. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the cure 
of a disease that is destroying our communities. And that disease is the major sin, the major sin of backbiting and slandering. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us the cure from this disease by saying, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who believe, ijtanibu kathira min al-dhan, avoid suspicion. Avoid a lot of sus suspicion. Because a little of it is a sin. A little suspicion is a sin. Why? Because suspicion, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described here in Ba'd uh, al-Dhani uh, itm, wala tajassasu. Suspicion leads to spying. He did something, I think he did it, I think she did it, I think he is on this, I think she is on that. Let me check. So I, I am fair to them when I talk about it, I am fair. This is the footsteps of the shaykh. And then what happens after the person spies on that person? He will come to fall into a major sin, and that major sin, Don't let one of you backbite the other one. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deter us from this sin, he says, he gave us a, a very envious image, it's a very disgusting image to, to think about and to ponder about. And he said, Does any one of you love to eat the flesh of his brother or sister after they are dead? Go to the corpse of your brother or sister and eat from them. None of us like it. None of us wants even to think about it. This is the alike of backbiting that person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to deter us with this disgusting image. He said, if you like to eat the flesh of your brother or sister after they die, then go ahead and backbite. You would like to backbite as if, if you like to eat the flesh, then you would like to backbite. So, to stop from the very beginning and not to fall in the footsteps of the shaitan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, don't sus suspect. Avoid suspicion. Because that will be, lead you automatically to think about, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be unfair or unjust or oppress this brother or sister, so let me see if it's really true or not. And that's spying. So from the very beginning, stop. It's none of my business. Judge what you see and leave the insight to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If the person says it, then that's the judgment. He's judging himself or herself. But if he did not say it, and you just interpreted or understood from what he said, your own interpretation, don't follow it with spying because it will lead to a major sin of backbiting. However, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again left the door of repentance for us. He said, Be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah. In Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept the door of repentance open. With his mercy, he's the most merciful, with his mercy, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So while building one of the blocks of building, Brotherhood is to avoid uh, avoid suspicion, which lead to spying, which leads to backbiting. May Allah protect us, guide us. Amen. Yeah. And again, I mean, you know, I mean, it's haram for us to even eat that flesh of, of an animal. Uh, so again, imagine, you know, eating the dead flesh of a human being. Right? Even, for example, if you are, you know, dying of hunger, Right? But on top of that, it's not just any human being. It is the it is your brother. Right? Can you imagine, you know, just you know, the the uh, disgust that you will feel, you know, to that to, to eat the flesh of your own family. So again, all of this, you know, is connected because in the Mamuna Ikhwa. Right? So this is what we're doing. Right? That, you know, we are eating the flesh of our brothers, right, and sisters in Islam. We have to uh, we have to you know, avoid that, right? And there's, you know, definitely a difference between, you know, uh, spying and verification. It's two different processes, 
right? And a lot of times we are doing, you know, the, the former versus the latter. We're not verifying things so that we can rectify, you know, uh, uh, certain situations, but we are spying, right, so that we can make the situation actually worse. Um, which leads us to our next verse, um, Sheikh Mufti, uh, uh, he's going to um, address that where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqanakum min dhakaran wa untha, wa ja'amnakum shuhuban wa qabaheena li ta'arafu, inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaakum, inna Allah alimun khabir, O mankind, surely we have created you from male and female, and have made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another, surely the noblest of you in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is the most God-fearing. Allah is sure of all knowing and all aware. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu wa rasulillah. So in this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is re-informing us because much of the Quran has been sent down which Allah, the sublime and the most high, spoke on our origins, where we come from, where we came from. Our ancestor, the greatest, highest, Adam, Hawa, and our ancestors, the sons, the children of Adam and Hawa. And as we mentioned before, with regards to the academic study of the Quran, Surah Al-Hajarat, uh, many scholars say is the 108th surah that was sent down. It is in 108 in the Mus'haf, part of uh, Juz Amma, but 107 surahs were sent down before chapter of Pujurat, okay? So obviously, if 107 surahs were sent down, indeed, Allah has spoken, told, and informed us where we come from. So in this verse, Allah, the sublime and most high, is re-informing us, reassuring us of our origin, our roots, and those roots, despite me being fair skinned, you being dark skinned, despite me being short, you being tall, despite you being brolic and brawny, and me being frail and weak, despite you having a petite frame, a large frame of this, that, the money, uh, what language you speak, what dialect of this language, ancient, modern, simplified, etc. What car you drive, what shoes you wear, etc. All of these different uh, things of distinction that we pride ourselves in. All right, you ever ask someone um, for sure they're from Asia, you say, are you uh, Chinese? Oh, no, 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 I'm Japanese. It's disrespect. If you ask someone if they're Korean, you say, no, of course not, I'm from China. If you ask someone from the Caribbean, are you from this island? And they act as if that other island that you mistakenly thought they were from is some far distant location. A brother comes from West Africa, you say, are you from Burkina Faso? And Except for the people that Allah blesses, who will turn red and start to snort. Ah, no, of course not. I'm from Guinea Bissau. In the country, the what? Right there. It's not like you ask them, are you from Russia, are you from South America, something which would be way out of, you know, common sense. So people, they pride themselves in these distinctions. You know, uh, are you parked there? No, I'm parked there. That's my car. But they pride themselves with these different distinctions. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he re-informs us it reinforms us where we come from, and no matter how we feel or think or look or dress or walk or talk, we're all really related. And we all come from one source and one origin. That is a man, a male, and a female. And as a side note, side note, fact that Jani Bia, they say, this verse clearly smashes and demolishes uh, the fallacies of homosexuality and pessimism and LGBTQ, etc. Whereas Many, a lot of them are Muslims, or they're paid monastics, we don't know. But they will argue and say that there's no proof in the Qur'an that prohibits homosexuality. There's no proof in the Qur'an that prohibits natural love between sexes. Lut, Sodom, Gomorrah, that was, you know, they were raping men. They were hijacked. They were criminals. They were forcing people against their will. But that doesn't discuss natural love and attraction to the same sex. You have people who will argue with this, unfortunately, on TV. A doctor, supposed to have the highest academic status, he'll argue on this. But can you tell me one verse in the Quran, just one, and I will submit to your cause, I'll be a supporter of the rainbow. Just one verse, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, min thakarin wa thakarin. 
فلما تغشاه غشى مين؟ ها الله always talks about male and female. Allah never speaks on male and female. And he never speaks on it. And this is a clear proof of a thing being obligatory, a thing being haram, a thing having no room to discuss. Uh, a reflection of this, say from one thing we learned 10,000 things, uh, some scholars of Islam consider it obligatory when you travel to shorten the prayer. Madhab, Rebbe Hanifa, and others, that when you travel, you have to shorten the prayer. It's not an option. Why do they say this? Some of them say all of the times that the Prophet traveled, when did he make four rakah? Can't find one hadith on this issue. Now, we're not here to talk about the Masad of Fakhir. We're not here to talk about the Hakim. I'm trying to make a point. Is that from their argument, the rationale that they use, that all of the time that the Prophet traveled, he never what? He never made a what? I just told you. He never made a full prayer. So how are you telling me that it's not a bit of it's not a bit and you can't find one example? So not once does Allah talk about male and male. Not once does Allah talk about female and female. How are you making this argument? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us where we come from, male and female. He tells us some of the wisdoms of making us to different tribes and to different nations, north, south, east, west. He tells us about uh, those who are Bedouins, those who are nomadic, those who are city dwellers, town dwellers, etc. Allah says, we've only made you like this and like that for you to know each other. That's it. And if it wasn't for the fact for me to uh, confuse my mother with a foreign woman, my wife with another person, my son that I have to spend upon, my daughter that I have to take care of with another daughter that isn't from my lineage, Allah made her look like this, look like that, speak like this, talk like that. It's hard of, that's it. He did not make you into tribes and nations to puff up your chests and say, I'm better than you. And look down upon others. And he who reads history clearly, clearly knows that some of the most horrible atrocities have been made under the name of racial or tribal superiority. Some of the worst genocides were made. We are better than them. And they are worse than us. They are inferior to us. And you just look at how racism and prejudice and tribalism, in reality, it makes no sense. It literally makes you a fool and a person of supreme lack of intelligence. And that is because if I'm better than you, my tribe, my race is better than your tribe. All right? How, how is that? How have you decided that your race and your tribe is superior? Because you have a few things of technology because you have some intelligence, because you have a city, because you have buildings, because you have this and you have that, and they don't have, so therefore they're automatically inferior. That's, that, that's illogical. Just because you travel with boats and you have cannons, it doesn't make you a superior human being to this race of people. And for argument's sake, if you were superior, absolutely, how are you to lose yourself and your soul just because they're inferior? So because they're inferior, and God didn't tell me anything authentic, but because you're an inferior tribe, I'm going to kill you, rape, plunder, destroy, commit genocide, at the same time I'm claiming to be a superior human being. How does that make you? You lost your soul trying to prove that you're superior, and all you did was prove that you're actually what? Inferior. So be mindful of, of, of stupidity that the shaitan offers the human being. And for argument's sake, you come from Africa, you come from Europe, come from India, you come from uh, North Africa, wherever you come from, Allah could give a people or race something that it doesn't give another. That's not impossible. That's a fact. People who come from this country, in general, in general, they're just naturally good at this. It's a fact. Or, Allah chose the Prophet to come from your race. That doesn't give you absolute superiority. If you look at history, you'll always find the conquered people, the vanquished people, they had points of superiority over their conquerors. That's basic history. It came to conquer this nation that lacked technology, that lacked sophistication, that lacked, that lacked, that lacked. But how many people in your army have died from cholera or from uh, typh ty uh, uh, typhus or so on and so forth? All these different diseases and illnesses, malaria. But these people have been living on this island, living in this land. They look at the disease and laugh at it. So the fact that you're sick and dying, that proves that the 
Um, the uncivilized savage people that you come to conquer and colonize, they have a word over you. They have some type of superiority. So Allah gives some nations intelligence more than others in general. Allah gives physical strength to some nation in general. Allah gives beauty, whatever, to different people. But for you to claim that you have <coughs> absolute superiority over all human beings, then something is truly off with your intellect. History has shown us those that were doing the conquering and the genocide and the colonizing, how they died, where they ended up, how they were killed, how they made suicide. But just yesterday you said that you were superior. Okay, if you look at World War II, as an example, talk about the Emperor of Japan, uh, Emperor uh, Hirohito. He was a god among his people. He was a descendant of the, of the sun god. He was divine on earth. And that was his creed. And that's how he, you know, taught and ruled his people. So obviously we know who lost World War II. We know that the, uh, the Empire of the Rising Sun, they didn't win. And do you know what the United States did to Japan? They dropped two bombs from two locations in Japan. And neither of those two bombs were dropped on the capital. And it wasn't a mistake. If they wanted to bomb Tokyo, they would have done so. But they dropped it on Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Why didn't they destroy the emperor just like that with a hydrogen bomb? Why, why not? They didn't kill the emperor intentionally because the emperor had to remain alive. He was the only one that would tell the fanatical loyal soldiers, war is done, it's over, it's lost, submit. We don't want no more of our young soldiers dying unnecessarily. You have to send that message to your people. And the reason why you have to send that message is look what we've just done. Within a matter of seconds, how many millions of people have been laid to waste? If you don't do that, the third bomb will find its target in Tokyo. And the emperor, he did that. He told his soldiers, he told his commanders, the war is over. We have lost. And we must sign a humiliating, uh, you know, it's, it's a surrender. So the highlighting point is, this emperor was told to stand in front of his people and to declare, he said, I am not a god. I am not the descendant of a god. I'm a normal human being. I'm nothing more than a political leader. Everything that I said about myself was untrue, and everything that you believed about me was untrue. So how did you go from being a superior race, the master race, the Chinese savages, dogs, animals, the Koreans are nothing of, of our lineage of Japan, and now you have to say in front of all of your people in the whole world, I was wrong. Sorry, I made a mistake. I wasn't a god. I wasn't a god. How humiliating that is. How about how many people lived, died, fought for him, believing that he was a god. And the United States says, you've got to take it all back. So the moral story is, if you think that you're superior to someone else because of a blessing, because of a gift that Allah gives you, then your, your faith is clearly off based off the verse. And your intelligence is clearly off. And that is proven through history. Now let's move forward. Uh, Allah Azza wa he tells us, لِتَعَرَفُ For you to know who to. And the Prophet of Allah in his quotes have said, تَعَلَّمُوا مِنَ الْأَنْسَابِكُمْ فَتَسِلُونَ بِهِ أَرْحَمَةً He said, learn your lineage for you to keep good relations with your family. That's it. And if that wasn't the case, there will be no tribe, there will be no Arab, there will be no Berber, there will be no Kurdish, there will be no Turkish, there will be no Sub-Saharan, there will be none of that if it wasn't for this wisdom. In the akramakum and Allahi atqaqum, the best of you to Allah, to me, Allah says, is He who fears me the most. That's it. End of discussion. What does your nose look like? What does your hair look like? Where do you come from? What achievements do you have? What buildings and pyramids do you have? None of that matters to me, Allah says. In the akramakum and Allahi atqaqum. Why and how is this? In Allah alimun khabir. Allah knoweth and you knoweth not. And Allah is khabir. His knowledge is utterly intimate. Al-Zahiru wal-Batin. Al-Zahiru ladhi laysa fawqahu shay. Wal-Batinu ladhi, the Prophet says, laysa duna ka shay. Nothing escapes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is the ayah by telling us, you think that you know that you're better, you feel that you're better, you're superior, but I know that the best from among you is he who fears me the most. That's food for thought. Another very important aspect I wish to share uh, is, is, is a, a manifestation of the human being's lack of intelligence. And, and it's unfortunate for us Muslims to follow this path. Instead of affirming racism and prejudice and tribalism and colorism, we should embrace our differences. 
And Allah tells us, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ From his signs of Allah's power, Allah's omnipotence, that Allah is the ilahu haq, the true deity worship, خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ The creation of the universe, the heavens and earth. وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ Allah says the differences, the diversity of your shades, your skin color, and the difference of your tongues and your dialects. Human DNA, the same or different? I have two elbows, you have two elbows. My tongue, my lips, my teeth, my thorax, all of these different things, uh, voice box, etc. People, they are, they're made from the same matter, but they're very, 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 very different. That's a, that's a sign. In the fidelika, the ayatin, then I mean. Allah says, men who have knowledge, they take this as a lesson. You're black, you're white, you're red, you're this. That's a good thing, not a bad thing. So we should embrace our diversity. The panel is diverse. He has an age. He has an experience. He has an expertise. He has a profession. We embrace the diversity. We don't reject the diversity. Last but not least, uh, to be honest and to be real, it's very sad what happens in many masjids, many centers, uh, how the Muslims treat each other, how the Muslims look at each other, look down upon each other, okay, the racism and the prejudice that you feel. Some places you can feel it, literally. You walk into the door, the people, they turn around and they look at you like, are you lost? Do you belong here? Well, how can I help you? Well, I can tell you stories you wouldn't believe in Ramadan, in Jumu'ah. The racism that exudes from some of us. But don't allow this to tell you. And don't allow this to be a cause for you to leave Islam. And many people, they leave Islam because of how they're treated. Christians treated me better. The Catholics, they treated me better. The Hindus, the Buddhists, the Jews, the atheists, the Hebrew Israelites, they were better examples for no racism and prejudice than those who say, La ilaha illallah. That's a fact. That is because the Prophet tells us in the hadith, Arba'un min umur al or Arba'un fi umur he says four things in my nation that my nation will never ever do away with. It will, it will always be existent in my nation. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Al-Fakhru bil ahsab wa ta'nu fil ansab wa istisqa'u bil njumi wa niyaha ila akhir hadith. He says, as people bragging about their background, I'm the son of so and so. In this tribe, I am this and I am that. Wa ta'nu and poking and stabbing at other people's lineage. You're a Berber, or you're Turkish, we're Arabs, or you're the descendant of a slave. Your people used to be slaves. You're not You're not really black. I come from West Africa. I'm the pure African ivory coast. You're a slave. He's poking at people's lineage. It is from Jahiliya. And the Prophet Wasallam says, thirdly, seeking rain through the stars, and last but not least, shrieking and wailing over the dead. So Allah Azza wa he tells us, And when the believers saw the Jews, saw the Christians, saw the Munafiqun, saw the Mushrikun, when they saw all of those allied confederates to fight them, to, to kill them in Medina, they said, What? Had that, this is the thing, that Allah and His Messenger has promised us. And Allah and His Messenger have indeed spoken the truth. Allah says, And the only thing that it increased in men was, Faith and submission. So when you see racism among the Muslims, embrace it and realize that the Prophet spoke the truth. Over 1,400 years ago, he told us it's going to be a Muslim who's going to scorn his Muslim brother. It's going to be a Muslim who's going to look at blood and DNA instead of faith, deen. And I, the last thing I will say, as an imam, and I've been an imam for many years out of my life, if I had one job, any exaggeration, for every single time, I dealt with an interracial marriage. The father or the mother shutting it down just because of blood and background, I would not be sitting here today. I will be a very wealthy man. <laughs> he's a bad Muslim. He doesn't pray. He doesn't work. No. He's Arab. No. He's from Bangladesh. No. He's from this side of the border. You know, 20 years ago, there was no border. There was no north and south. No. Can't marry my children. She's in. You're not good enough for her. For no other reason. And there lies no doubt. This, among many other things, is a major, major manifestation of racism and prejudice that we as Muslims suffer from. The cure for sure can be found in this ayah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala truly knows this. Jazakallah khair, inshaAllah. 
we're going to move on. I know that uh, Imam Akil, he has the next, uh, next verse, inshallah ta'ala. Then uh, I think after this commentary, we can kind of uh, just wrap up with the concluding um, remarks to kind of, you know, uh, bring the last verses um, to, to an end. Uh, so the next verse, ayah 14, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Qalat al-A'rabu amanna kullam tu'minu wa lakin kudu aslamna wa lamma yadukhuda al-Iman fi kudubikum wa in tuti'u allaha wa rasulahu wa la yadidkum min a'manikum shay'a inna allaha rafur rahim The desert Arabs, um, or the Bedouins, uh, they say we believe, say to them you do not believe, you should rather say we submit for faith as not yet entered into your hearts. Never, nevertheless, if you obey Allah and His Messenger, you will not hold back anything of your deeds. Surely Allah is forgiving, uh, merciful. In this verse, Allah Ta'ala says, The Bedouins, they say we have Iman. They say we believe. Say to them, you don't believe. Or rather say that we have embraced Islam. And faith has yet to enter into your heart. Now, we've been having discussion, discussions about reasons for revelation. When you're able to identify a reason for revelation, then it gives you context of the verse. It tells you what the verse is actually about and what it is applying to. So we can take some examples in our lives so that we're not just extracting what we want from the Quran and then applying our understanding to whatever we want because when we're speaking to of the Quran, when we're speaking to the exegesis of the Quran, the goal is to get as close as possible to what Allah intended by what he said and not necessarily anything that one can mean by what Allah said. Two different things, if that makes sense. So when we look behind this particular verse here, we find that it is about Bini Esed ibn Khuzayma, a tribe, a tribe of Bedouin. And their story, what's going on with them, a few things are going on. They take their shahada, they take their shahada to become Muslims. And in what is outwardly projected, they're Muslim, but in private, they were not believers. Right? They weren't believers. So the indicator here is that they embrace Islam on a basis of nifat, that they embrace Islam on a basis of hypocrisy. Not hypocrisy in English, but hypocrisy in Islam. Hypocrisy in Islam is when, when, when one openly shows and displays that they're Muslim. They give the salam, they may wear a Muslim garb, or they may pray or fast, but really they're not Muslim. Really their faith, really they're a person, of, they're, they're a Christian or a Jewish faith or they're a Buddhist or whatever their faith is. They're just displaying that they're Muslim in order to get some benefit from the Muslims that they have or in order to harm the Muslims from the inside out and lower the defenses of the Muslims because the Muslims think that they're Muslim. So, they embrace Islam this way, and then they say to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu oh, these Arab tribes here and these tribes over there, they, they fought you and they opposed you and, and they called you names, and we're not doing any of that. Just give us some salah, just give us some money, just give us some charity. That's these people. And we also find out about them that, uh, interestingly enough, they wanted the title of being from the Muhajirin. They wanted the title of being from those who made Hijra to Medina. However, they never made Hijra. <laughs> and they didn't intend to make Hijra. They just wanted the title, right? So with all this going on in the background, there is some confusion that they caused as well. With all of this going on in the background, in this verse, Allah states, Father to Allah, the Bedouins have said, so he doesn't call them people of Iman, indicating their nifat, indicating their hypocrisy, right? That's what's going on here in the verse. So we understand from this that there is a difference 
between embracing Islam and embracing Iman. We understand from this that the natural order and progression of our faith, it has levels. We're going to give an example. So we're going to draw an imaginary circle together, right? This is a circle, all right? See the circle? All right, y'all see the circle. We're going to call this circle the circle of Islam. Anyone inside of this circle is a Muslim, and anyone outside of this circle is a, a non-Muslim, a cow. Good. How do you go from the fold of kufr to the fold of Islam? How do you exit from the fold of not being a Muslim and entering into the fold of Islam becoming a Muslim? What do you do? Shahada. Okay, good. Let's take that. So you state your shahada, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. You're a Muslim now. Fine. Because you're a Muslim, does this mean that you're practicing everything of Islam? Not necessarily. So then inside of this circle, there is a smaller circle. In this smaller circle, it is called the circle of Iman. Anyone inside of this circle is a mu'min, is a person of faith. Anyone outside of this circle is a Muslim. So you've taken your shahada now. You believe Islam is the truth. So now how do you go from being a Muslim to a mu'min? From the fold of Islam to the fold of Iman. How do you do that? Please. You have to believe in Iman? Keep going. We heard good. Okay, good. So, so you're acting upon your belief now. You are completing the commandments and abstaining from the prohibition. Okay? So once you're in a space where you're completing the commandments and you're abstaining from the prohibitions, now you're entering into the fold of Iman. Now you're becoming a mu'min. And inside of the circle of Iman, there is still yet a smaller circle, and that circle is called the circle of Ihsan, the circle of beauty, the circle of excellence. So how do you go from being a mu'min to a muhsin? How do you go from being a believer to a beautiful person? How do you do that? In this space, these are now the voluntary acts. These are the acts that are must have. These are the acts that are optimal. Now you're abstaining from the mekruh hat. Now you're abstaining from the acts that are discouraged. Those acts that Allah, he's displeased with, but he, you don't accrue a sin for it. Now you are staying away from the things that are doubtful. Now, because you want to earn the pleasure of Allah so much, you're willing to stay away from some of the halal out of fear of falling into the haram. This is that space. To you, in the circle of Ihsan, to you, you're not so much concerned, is it wajib, is it must is it obligatory, or is it highly recommended? It's pleasing to Allah, we're trying to do it. You're not so much concerned. Is it makruh or is it haram? Are you, are you saying that I can't do this? That's not your concern at this level. Now you can, is Allah displeased with it? Okay, I'm going to try to abstain from it. Now, you understand that each circle got smaller. So if you understand that each circle got smaller, you understand that there are, there are less people of Islam than there are people of Iman. And you understand that there are less people of Iman than there are people of Islam. So far, so good? If this makes sense, every muhsin is a mu'min and a muslim. Every mu'min is a muslim. Not necessarily is every muslim a mu'min. And not necessarily is every mu'min a muhsin. Does that make sense? That's what our Lord is speaking about in this verse, see? And even the people of hypocrisy, even the people that they're kufar, but they're around the Muslims acting like they're Muslims, our Lord Ta'ala still gives them a shot in this verse. As he states, and we're not going to neglect or deem deficient anything of your deeds in the law of the former Rahim. So to the Allah, he is all forgiven, he's merciful. So then whatever good that you did do, just make tawbah, just repent, just get right, you still got opportunity. 
And if you do that, you still keep the get, you still get to keep your good deeds as well. Because even if you were a non-Muslim, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu is mentioned, Aslamta alama aslamta bin al khayr You have embraced Islam upon whatever has preceded you of good. And all of us find ourselves in this range fluctuating between Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. We ask Allah that He makes us people of Ihsan, people of beauty, people of excellence in our worship. I mean, I mean, and you know, we have to definitely understand that, you know, there are stages of, of, of development uh, when it comes to uh, our embracing of Islam and, you know, beautifully uh, put by Imam Aqil going from Islam to Iman to, to Ihsan. And, and this is, you know, humbling, you know, for, for us that are in this uh, transformational stage or embracing Islam. You know, but again, you know, important, you know, just looking at the terminology where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, right not yet. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them an opportunity, and that's highlighted in the next verse, actually, you know, where he defines what is actually iman and, uh, and some of the things that they can actually do to kind of, you know, prove this. Um, so as we, you know, um, I guess conclude, you know, um, you know, with some of the last verses, you know, uh, of Surah Al-Hujurat, uh, we still, I mean, uh, 15 and 16 is, is kind of connected, uh, or, or is connected to the whole Arab, the Bedouins. Um, so if anyone wants to make any comments on that, if not, then we can conclude with uh, verse verses 17 and 18, which is basically summarizing uh, Surah Al-Hujurat. Assalamu Let me give some nasihat, inshallah ta'ala. <coughs> There's two things that we mentioned. One was, uh, mm. this, Allah created two types of human beings, male and female. Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Um, the reason I mention that is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala destroyed these people. So you stay away from what Allah has destroyed. And if you know anything of the seal of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he passed those places like, 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 like Mahasak, when you're going to uh, Hajj with the people, the you know, Alam Taraqib, Allah Rabbul Qadasfil, the Prophet said, I'm going to speed his camp. You know, and the, and the people of, uh, when he passed through the people of Adam Tamuz, he would hear the punishment, the torment, and the grave. So when Allah destroyed the people, you stay away from that. And the other thing I want to mention was uh, uh, what is Iman and, and Hassan, they mentioned, you know, and, and Hadith, we had the Prophet in Jabri, I kept him, I should have kept him as a stranger. He says, "Akbirni anil iman, antumna billahi wa malaika wa kutub wa rasul wa yom al akhir wa tubna bil khadi khali khali wa shad." Believe in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, prophets, right? And to believe in, in the, that He has the power of good and evil. Then He asks him, "Akbirni?" As he says, "Qala sadaqa." He says, "Akbirni anil ihsan." And this is where we as Muslims have to really understand this. It doesn't veil. It's been lifted here. Worship Allah as though you see him. Even though you know you cannot see him, right? He certainly sees you. I mean, well, yeah. Um, so, um, in the, uh, inshallah, we'll do some final comments about uh, the last, either you can take the last verses or just uh, final comments about uh, the Surah Hujurat or uh, just some final Nasiha, inshallah. Uh, so we should start with, um, and, and then you know, I know we have some questions as well, so we'll start with our check. I'll do some of inshallah. Just in addition to what um, <clears throat> my brother Atin said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ittaqu allaha haqqa tuqatihi, wa la tamutunna illa wa antum, Muslimun, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here, what is the minimum to get to Jannah? Islam, right? So what's the minimum to get to Jannah? Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala jannah. So the minimum to get to Jannah is Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us here that when we live our life, we'll live our life on Iman. And we strive for Ihsan and we die upon Islam. So we live our life 
in Iman and we strive for Ihsan and the minimum required is Islam. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu taqu Allah haqqa tuqadi Be mindful of Allah, be conscious of Allah the way he deserves to be conscious about which means try your best to fulfill the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to follow the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the minimum is that you die upon Islam so in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muslims we should be diligent in pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we should be diligent in following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu as much as we can we try our best to be among the Muhsineen. If we fall short, we fall among the Mu'mineen. And if we fall short, we still are Muslims and we die as them. That's one. Two, uh, looking at the verses uh, of Surah Al-Hujurat, and in, basically in the whole the Quran, SubhanAllah, the verses and the, and the ending of the verses always reflect the meaning of the ayah or give you an idea of what's supposed to be done after you read a verse. Through the, uh, the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are used in those verses. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu ishtanibu kathira min al-dhani inna ba'da al-dhani ith wa la tajassasu wa la yatabba'atukum ba'da ayuhibbu ahadukum ayyakula ahim akhiyya maytan fakaritumur attaqu Allah inna Allah tawabur rahim You may fall into spying, backbiting, slandering but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended it with Tawabur Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is accepting your tawbah. Anytime you repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with sincerity, you will accept it. And then the next verse, in Allah Alim al Khabir, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks in this verse about taqwa. Where is the taqwa? It's in the heart. Nobody knows about it except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah is the all knowing, and nothing escapes the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the last verses of the of this surah and is, ends with in Allah basir, Wallahu basirun, When the Arab came to the Prophet sallam, and he said, We believed and we are supporting you, we are uh, adding more force to you, and, and so on and so forth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told them, Don't say that, and so Iman settles in your heart now, say we just entered Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows at the end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is watchful of what you are doing and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing what you are doing. In addition to this as well, وَلَا يَلَتْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, with his mercy subhanahu wa ta'ala he will not let your deeds go into waste and more than this, more than this, when a person comes into Islam, into the fall of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns his bad deeds into good deeds. يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنًا وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا The most forgiven, the most merciful. So, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is this, then this has to be in us dealing with one another. And that is the forgiven and the mercy. These are two major components of building Brotherhood, be forgiven and be more merciful when dealing with, with, dealing with one another. And then muwalat, when we support someone, and muwalat lillah, when muwalat lillah, when we take a stand from someone, when we take a stand from someone, we take a stand from that person because that person is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is disobeying the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when we hate, when we have hatred towards someone, we should have hatred towards, when we're talking about the brother and the sister in Islam, we should have, have hate towards their actions, not themselves, not the person himself. Why? Because if we hate the person, we will never be able to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preferred this ummah with, which is al-amr bin ma'rufi wa nahyu anil munkar. If I break my relationship with my brother, I will never be able to enjoin good and forbid evil. And this is the characteristic of this ummah. Which means keep that line between you and your brother, even if he is committing the major sins, and even if he is disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
keep that line going between you and him and her so you can advise, you can perform one of the major components that made this ummah the best of the ummah. Allah ta'ala ala wa alam ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to preserve our brotherhood and our sisterhood upon the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah ta'ala ala wa alam. Jazakallah khair, Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for how, you know, just uh, allowing us to, again, capture the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this discussion. Um, and it's important that we reflect over these names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, and how they are actually connected to the verses that uh, that they actually actually conclude. Um, and I know they put us out, inshallah, you know, as well. So uh, we want to um, just wrap up, um, you know, but, you know, as brotherhood, sisterhood, we have to also, you know, understand that we are on different levels, right, of our uh, Islam, our Iman, Right, and you know, I mean, and, and this is important again too. And when you understand that people are on different levels, then again, you know, you can appreciate, you know, or you can, you know, work together uh, more. And I conclude with um, this verse number seventeen um, because I think it's extremely important. Um, you know, all like all the verses, you know, in the Quran, where Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Ya mununa alayka an aslamu kulla tamunun." Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says they regard it as a favor to you that you have become Muslim. Say, in accepting Islam, you have not conferred a favor upon me. Rather, it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who bestows a favor on you that he has led you to faith by uh, provided Right, that you are that you are truthful. Right. Alhamdulillah Ladi Hadana Lihada Allah Kuna Lina Hadiya Allah and Allah. Right, that we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for guiding us to to this Islam. Right? To being part of the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right, to be part of the Kitab Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. And with that, you know, making us you know, the best ummah, kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat min nas, right, that you, that has ever evolved out of mankind, so we have to embrace that, and we have to embrace that as, you know, brothers and sisters in Islam, as a community, and we have to begin to grow, and we have to begin to mature, um, inshallah ta'ala, and we have to begin to heal, we have to begin to heal, right, the hearts that have been wounded, the feelings that have been hurt, Right, and the things that has been uh, the false information that has been spread, right? So, this healing process, inshallah ta'ala, right, is found throughout the Quran. But we can start with Hujarat, inshallah ta'ala, to again to give us that blueprint, that map, inshallah ta'ala, to make uh, make our affairs better as Muslim brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, let Brother uh, Tariq, inshallah ta'ala, in this hour, inshallah, with the closing remarks, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, for coming and to the event. Alhamdulillah, uh, nothing good actually. Uh, I wanted to, before, does anybody, each of you, you want to make a one minute close the box? Yeah, we got to leave. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. You know, since I'm the oldest one in here, I'll I give you the last advice, inshallah ta'ala. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leads us an ayat in the Quran that we all should learn this ayat by heart and remind it. You know, he says, Wa atasimu bi abillahi jamiyah, wa la tafarrakum. Wa adhkuru ni'amatullah alaykum is kuntum a'da'an fa'allafa bina kulubikum fa'asbahtum bi ni'amati ikhwan. Wa kuntum ala shafa' hukratul minna, fa'unqadakum minha. Kadhalika yubayinu Allah lakum ayatihi la'akum tahtadun. This is very important ayat. Whole affairs all together. All together to the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and be not divided. <clears throat> and remember Allah's favor when you were enemies among yourselves. And it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, It is He that has aligned our hearts and caused us to become brothers. And when we come to Ma'ala Jafar Hukratan Minan, now we were all not fell into the fire. This is for Allah's ayah, and then he has clearly clarified it for you, mashallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us, may he protect us, and may you have a safe trip home.
جزاكم الله خيرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله Once again, uh, I need to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his countless blessings. And I would like to thank, once again, uh, our host, Brother Tariq, and everyone else behind the scenes uh, that was a part of me coming here today. My panelists, uh, my older brothers in Al-Islam, those who preceded me. Uh, <laughs> got some great shit. Mine's just cat here, lit. Uh, May Allah bless them and allow them to return safely as well. And last but not least, or before that, uh, the Deanna Center for hosting us, allowing us to use their beautiful facility. We thank them as well. And last but not least, everyone in attendance for showing your love, your support, uh, your your cooperation upon that which is pleasing to Allah, hopefully. And if I have any advice with regards to the topic, building blocks, the foundation of Islamic Brotherhood, that you have to keep a vigilant eye, a watchful eye, on that which will destroy the Islamic Brotherhood. And that is because establishing the Islamic Brotherhood, I would say, is relatively easy. No, I'm not. Non-Muslims, the first thing that they know about Islam is Muslims are brothers. Salaam alaikum, they don't eat pork, and aki. Non-Muslim sees you, and they see you dress a certain way, they say, yeah, brother. Come on, brother. They know this. So building this family, brotherhood, and sisterhood is relatively easy. There are challenges. But it's not about us being brothers. It's about us protecting, us being jealous. Very, very, very jealous and insecure of us losing through envy, through racism, prejudice, through greed, through being an egomaniac, and anything else that threatens our brotherhood and our sisterhood. So that's my advice, is that in the winter time, it's not about just having the heat on, but you got to make sure that you don't have any cracks. You got to make sure that the walls are insulated. You got to make sure that everything is closed because turning the heat on is relatively easy. But if everything is not tight and secure, all of that precious energy, the heat will seep out, and you'll be cold. And that's what Islamic brotherhood and sister is. Shaitan wants us not to be with each other. The devil is from the human beings. They don't want us to be together. So we have to constantly aware of getting into arguments, fights, being envious, being jealous, us having pride, or any other negative feeling or emotion that is going to take us away from each other, keep us separated. And Allah surely knows best. I will briefly echo the words of our brother, Mr. Ahmed, and just we want to thank Dr. Bilal, the president of the Diamond Center, and all the staff that allowed us to be here. And we thank our brother, our brother Todd, for, for having this idea. Uh, he's been talking about this for, for years, I don't know if you know that. Um, he's been speaking about the code of, of and ethics of brotherhood in the city of Jadah since forever. We're glad to see it come to fruition. And uh, for all these team panelists here, this is actually um, an example of brotherhood in and of itself. Uh, some of us, um, we see each other a little more frequently. Some of us, it's been some years we physically have seen each other. And others, it's been the first time that we actually come together in the same place like this. So we hope that this is an example of brotherhood moving forward. We thank all of you. Inshallah ta'ala, we'll do it again. Barakallahu feekum. As-salamu alayhi wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, Zakumullah khairan, brother, for brothers for being here, family from New Jersey, and from far in Baltimore. Uh, brother Tariq, Zakumullah khairan for making this happen. And uh, brothers and sisters, the attendants, Zakumullah khairan for your coming, your patience, your listening to us. Uh, I want to add something, inshallah, before we close and uh, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Fussilat, uh, when it comes to uh, brotherhood, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us remedies and cures of uh, hatred and grudges and animosity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Idfa' billati hiya ahsan, fa idha alladhi baynaka wa baynahu adawatun, كأنه ولي حميم وما يلقاها إلا الذين صبروا ما يلقاها إلا ذو حظ عظيم فإما ينزغنك من الشيطان نزغ فاستعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم الله سبحانه وتعالى 
He's telling us that when evil comes to you, from those, especially from those who you love and you trust, and something that hurts you comes from them to you, don't return it with that which is hurtful to be even with the person, but return it with that which is good. And the last panel that I gave us a promise here. Your enemy will become your closer supporter. Your enemy will, becomes, will become your friends, your close friends, your intimate friend. This necessitates a lot of patience. And this necessitates someone who has true belief and he will get a great reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the shaitan will not let this happen. The shaitan whispers to you, and so you give him peace of you, peace of your mind. And he said this, say more. He said this, say double. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, And the shaitan whispers to you, the solution is easy. استعذ بالله إنه هو السميع العليم. Again, Allah subhanahu wa taala is all hearing and the all knowing, which matches again the meaning of the ayah. Allah knows and hears what the person is saying to you, and Allah knows their intention. So follow the cure that Allah subhanahu wa taala presented to you, and that enemy will be your friend. And that is return that which is evil with that which is good, but. It needs patience. And if you have if you don't have patience, فَإِنَّمَا الْحِلْمُ بِالتَّحَلُّمْ فَإِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ Train yourself to be patient, to react. And Allah Ta'ala A'la wa'alam jazakumullah khairan Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdi Shadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tuhu lay Allahumma ma kana min sawabin fa min Allahi wa ma kana min khata'in wa nisyan fa minna min al-shaytan wa Allah wa rasuluhu min hubara Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, one of the things they said, and so, basically, that covers male and female. And we asked the question, and so, inshallah, we also want to um, try to have something in a couple of months, uh, maybe at the beginning of the year, for the sisters, a sisters only situation with sister scholars. Um, but also, you know, our sisters, we should have a, a, a concern. We had an incident with a sister that had, that had got kidnapped and murdered. Um, we're still following up as far as the trial to be able to make sure that this guy goes to jail. That's uh, October the 11th. Um, uh, and he's going to be the trial. At, uh, I mean, they're going to start the trial or they're going to start, you know, some of the hearings um, that's going on. So we're trying to make sure that the support. And support our sisters is important because uh, we're the protectors of the sisters and they have to see your presence. So we're pushing for that. And talking about that, there's a sister, um, uh, you know, Afia. Um, this brother's a champion for and I remember um, he had an accident one time and I gave him a ride back from New Jersey. And um, I had, you know, seen him chop, you know, fight before and everything and, you know, read about it. But one day he gave me a video from when she was in college uh, at the University of Houston. She was going to go to MIT. And she was a college student. And man, the sister spoke, it was amazing. I'm like, wow, I mean, you know, love this dean, extremely intelligent, was able to make you feel, build, build the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the people in the sincerity. Because like I said, we gotta keep it real. In everything that happened during that 23 year period, real. You know, all of the, the people that don't believe in the, the spirituality, but we know it was real. They, they 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 talk about what happened and they have to they have to they, they, um, agree upon it. All right. Well, they told us the while ago they ended. So one of the things, the last ayah, I and the last part is, Inna Allah yaqimu ghayru samawati wa arq, wa Allahu basiru ma ta'ala. That's the mind. But Allah, He surely knows what is in the heavens and the earth, and Allah. Is watching what you do. So always be constant. Zakalaka, thank you. Inshallah, it's beneficial. And begin with the brother, they can give you the link. 
it's um, it's being recorded, saved, so for our future, and maybe you can bring the brotherhood together and just pass on the message. Salaamu alaikum, rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.